Hey guys, welcome to part 5 of what if Naruto became serious during Shunan exam. If you enjoy the video then like, share and subscribe and also comment your thoughts as it inspires me to make more such videos and remember to check out my playlist section for other interesting stories. So let's get started. Chapter 16. This Winding Road, Part 2. Uzumaki Naruto, classified as dead by Konoha, was now jumping along three foreign shinobi that Konoha once again considered as its allies. Two of the more expressive siblings kept looking at the blonde in bewilderment just as to what had happened during the several months that occurred within Konoha's walls. Gara, however, was much more withdrawn. Inside his mind, Shukaku was restless, by no means was he throwing out suggestions of genocide, slaughter and the morbid thoughts that he kept on insisting to Gara. On the contrary, Shukaku was quiet, it looked solemnly and Gara had noticed the slight tremble he was experiencing as of now. He was twitching as if something had made it afraid. Shukaku was never afraid of anything. Even with the realization of Kayubi within Naruto, Shukaku was by no means scared of the Kayubi. If it were, then their fight outside the walls of Konoha back then would have been avoided. Something irks you, Gara said in monotone, staring at the raccoon dog who was looking down, almost unresponsive. You would do well to not speak to me like that, boy. Especially not now when there is something unsettling from that brat from Konoha. I am perplexed that you seem to still be frightened of me, Shukaku. It was then that the world around Gara had become completely black and his view had changed from the lush green leaves of Konoha's enormous forest, to the dark and almost pitch black area to where he is standing now. In front of him, stood Naruto who had the nine-tailed fox sitting behind him. But what got Gara's attention was a man, no, a being constructed by what he could tell as Chakra standing just in between the gigantic fox and the Konoha ninja. The man's outlines showed several cloths wrapping around him, a long Shikuho staff in his hand and a clothed headband on his head. Gara looked back to Shukaku and then looked back to Naruto and the man who was grinning at them from ear to ear. Why is it so, Shukaku? Are you not also considered by father to be a son as well? Would that not make us siblings? Shukaku looked down seemingly ashamed and he could not look at the man eyed eye. Who are you? What is going on? Gara asked, genuinely curious. His name is Asura Otsuki, the youngest son of the Sage of Six Paths. Naruto replied helpfully with a sheepish grin. Gara's eyes widened. The myth of the Rakuto Senen was well known throughout the elemental nations. Personally, Gara thought of it as nothing more than a myth. After all, the Rakuto Senen had set the guidelines of the fabled Ninshu, the teachings of peace and goodwill. Yet with the conflict that existed in between the clans and later on, the countries themselves, he found it hard to believe that someone would preach about love and peace. Surely, anyone would have followed with that idea. But Gara had seen firsthand the cruelties that humanity can beset one another. So he had no reason to believe neither in the Rakuto Senen nor in his ideals. To him, they do not exist. For if man truly wanted peace, then they would have stuck with Ninshu and beings like him would have never been created out of necessity and paranoia. But here it was, this construct of Chakra, standing beside the boy and grinning from ear to ear, claiming of his parentage as that of the revered god of the ninja world. It was truly an unbelievable claim. Or are you scared that I would look at you differently, even though I have long since known that you were lashing out your anger and pain? I have never understood the concept of Ninshu, Asura. You should know how I am inclined to believe that humans are worthless. They will be doomed by their own design. I am merely accelerating the process. Our father was human, Shukaku, he would not have liked to see you acting this way. You and father are the exceptions to that rule. Thousands of years I have watched as humans kill other humans, find means of killing each other in new ways and even as, imprisoning and using us as tools in their worthless conflict. You could not even begin to understand the betrayal we had suffered after your deaths. Asura closed his eyes and shook his head solemnly, time has made you a cynic, Shukaku. No, Asura, it has made me see the truth for what it is. Humanity is doomed to kill itself and this planet. They are better off gone, they have spat on father's hope for too long. Naruto looked at the two talking figures and raised an eyebrow before turning to Shukaku with an annoyed look. Hey. What gives you the right to send us to death for things some of us didn't even do? Shukaku looked at the boy and huffed, Karama's brat, just you being a shinobi makes you a macabre of the teachings of the Sage of Six Paths. 
Even I know that you are an insult to him and his ideals. Even if you are the reincarnation of Asura, you are still prescribed to the same system that has ravaged this planet for more than a millennium. There is little incentive to give you the benefit of doubt. Just because I'm a shinobi doesn't mean I'll go down the same path. We all have our choices to make. If you think being like that makes you better than humans, then you seriously need to think about it again. Naruto looked back on his memories, both happy and sad. He recalled them fondly, as both a reminder of his pain and his happiness, everyone can change. I'm living proof of people that can change their mindset. It's true, people can be horrible but if that's true, the opposite should also be true as well. Gara right there, he's also the same. He's changed. You need to understand that. And I'll prove to all of you that we can change. Kurama smirked from behind the boy, brat, your age is showing. You are far too naive of the world. The one that you are touting is nothing more than fantasy without the necessary strength. You will fall against the world for something so meaningless. But if you wish to continue in this path, then we will see who will bend first. Will it be you, or will it be this cruel world? Naruto merely smirked back at the giant beast. Shukaku gave a huff at Kurama and said haughtily, It is unfortunate for you, Kurama, to have gotten stuck with such an idiot. Kurama merely gave a scoff and gave a snarky reply, I've been stuck with idiots since I was born. You were no better. Shukaku seemed to show his fury at that, just because you have nine tails, doesn't mean you're the strongest. Fuck you, Kurama. Asura had to palm his face at this, even the biju were not immune to such petty conflict. He supposed it to be that way, though. His father intended for them to experience living with such emotions, after all. Excuse me. Gara had muttered and all the inhabitants of their current location turned to look at the red head with a curious glance. Where and why exactly are we here? The boy asked. Asura grinned, a special place, child. A place only the biju know and to a certain extent, a jinchuriki. This place is where we can talk freely amongst ourselves, though this is the first time I've been here myself. Only the biju and those that we let in can enter this plane. Asura has insisted that we brought you in for a chat in order to see who Shukaku's jailer is. Kurama replied as he looked down to the youngest son of the Sage of Six Paths who held out his hand to Shukaku with the most sincere smile on his face. Shukaku, even though it has been so long and so painful for you, I ask of you this not as the inheritor of Ninshu and not as someone who wishes to carry out our father's will, but as your brother in all but blood. I want you to start believing again. Shukaku turned to Asura with a gobsmacked expression, you expect me to give them one more chance, Asura. After all of the things that have happened in our lives. Asura smiled again and patted his outstretched hand to Shukaku's arm and then placing his other hand on Naruto's head. Just like what father used to say to me, one day, you will understand as much as I understand you. A moment of silence existed before the Tanuki spoke finally, one final chance, Asura, they have one final chance. I will believe once more but only because you said it yourself. Your word is father's word, after all. Asura grinned and then turned to Gara and patted him on the head as well. You are strong, child. You have suffered much and you have gained wisdom through that pain. You have learned to love despite it. That mark suits you, child, and it bears all your sorrow. Shukaku will be in good hands. Naruto turned to look to his right, his face turning into a frown. Someone is following us, Naruto mentioned as his sharp and battle-hardened instincts came into play with his perception turning back into the real world. You've been following us for quite some time now, what exactly are your intentions? Konkuro looked back and the shadowed figure revealed himself to them. The four of them smirked. Shikamaru's team. Shikamaru cursed quietly as he stared down at the only female member of the enemy squad. Always the worst luck of the draw. This is such a pain. The genius thought as he crouched and hid from the female Odo ninja's sights. He had recalled how everything was shot to hell after Neji and Tenten left the team. He had an array of strategies already in mind as he discussed it with his team. When they finally caught up and everything was in order, one of the Odo nin thought it was a good time to go crazy and flipped as he tackled Kiba who now had the wooden barrel within his care. The two of them fell off of a deep-looking ravine leaving Lee and him behind into facing the woman. Now the battle wouldn't normally problematic then, Lee was an astute shinobi despite his problem and responded well on orders. But things got complicated when another sound ninja made his presence known. 
Now Shikamaru didn't seem to be scared for a second there. In fact, he already had a plan in his head for such an emergency. Unfortunately, the lady they had as an opponent was looking scared shitless at the guy with the white hair and eyeliner. If that didn't sound any alarm bells ringing in his head, he doubted nothing would. Lee had pursued even though Shikamaru had advised against it. Lee reasoned out that their objective would get away. Shikamaru explained his observations and the unknown factors surrounding their new enemy and Lee understood. The green-clad genin also had noticed it too and said to Shikamaru that he would be chasing after the enemy regardless. Shikamaru had no choice but to let Lee go after the newly identified enemy took the sealed barrel with him. Giving a sigh once more, Shikamaru descended to the ground and hid beneath the shrubbery as Tuyuya scanned around her and finally drawing out a flute from her pouch. Well, time to get this show on the road. Shikamaru grabbed a small pebble from the ground and played with it for a moment before he looked back to where Tuyuya was and smirked. I'm not good in shunshun, but I guess there will be a first time for everything. Kiba vs. Sakan. Smash. A rock just shattered seconds after Kiba had successfully dodged a blow that could have crushed his skull in. Lee had given him sufficient data regarding his opponent's skill. Apparently the guy can deliver multiple blows in a single swing. However, much of how the mechanics were lost to them as they found it quite difficult to decipher. Kiba hadn't expected he and Akamaru could survive after a fall like that. The deep ravine that they fell through was said to be one of the fissures caused by the rampage of the nine-tailed fox. But looking at the cliff face, it looked like it was much older than just over a decade ago. There were shrubs that grew big enough at the walls of stone and earth that could be as close to a century old. Akamaru had barked forcing Kiba's attention back to the fight as the blue-haired man closed the distance between them with a fist drawn back and making its way towards his head. Kiba surged chakra all around his body and jumped back, the effect of the shikyaku no jutsu, four legs technique taking place. When he landed, he skidded back slightly and snarled at the man. Kiba removed his hood from his head and let Akamaru jump out. Kiba then performed a series of hand seals and ended it in the seal of the tiger. With a deep breath, he inhaled as much oxygen as he can and breathed out a gout of flame from his mouth that turned into a large ball of fire. Kaden. Gukaku no Jutsu, Fire Release, Grand Fireball Technique. The flame surged forward, scorching the earth beneath and stones completely black beneath it. Saken, who was surprised by this jutsu, decided to jump to the side as a part of his uniform was singed from the flames as he jumped to the side. He growled in anger and Saken swore to make the boy pay. He would get his wish when Kiba decided to attack with close range and spun like a buzzsaw and swiping at the flame causing a ring of fire to surround him before slamming onto Saken who evaded just barely. Entenga, Blaze Rotating Fang. Kiba had slashed his claws down and three of his sharp appendages managed to slash Saken's right forehead all the way down to his face. There was no blood, as when the boy slashed the wound, the fire immediately cauterized it making a permanent scar on Saken's face. Kiba gave a grin as Saken looked at the boy and traced the line of the wound from the forehead to his cheek beside his lip. Kiba could see Saken grinding his teeth in sheer anger and then looked back to him with eyes that told him to prepare for an agonizing death. You little shitstain, by the time I'm done with you, no one's even going to recognize you, not your damn teammates and especially not your whore of a mother. Kiba grinned and pointed to himself with his thumb and all the self-assurance that he had, I'm not going to lose, not to you, not to anyone else and especially not to that prick, Sasuke. Terran Ken, Mock Fist. Multiple arms blurred as Saken smashed his fist down at Kiba who jumped back and arched his back to do a mid-air backflip. Beneath him was Akamaru, already performing the piercing fang technique onto Saken's face. Saken had no time to react as he leaned to the side while his torso was shredded by the white and gray drilling move performed by Kiba's partner. Kiba landed on the stony ground on the other side and ordered Akamaru to take cover. Get out of the way, boy. Kaden. Hosenka no Jutsu, Fire Release, Mythical Fire Flower Technique. This time, Smaller orbs of fire arched across the air and headed straight to Saken. The sound ninja decided to take cover from the hail of fireballs behind a stone wall and looked back as Kiba stopped being trigger happy with his jutsu while Saken growled in anger. He was about to think of a strategy to use when he had heard a particular hissing sound that sent alerted him of what he had just stumbled upon. It was like the sound of a den of angry hissing snakes. 
He turned around and saw multiple explosive notes strapped on to a rock just behind him and they were already past halfway for him to react faster and get away. Shit. Boom. Multiple explosions rocked the bottom of the ravine as Kiba grinned and patted Akamaru on the head. Good work, Akamaru. The dog gave a bark in satisfaction for his job well done. As the smoke cleared, Sakin appeared from the fire and brimstone, angry, hurt, and enraged. Part of his skin was charred from the proximity of the explosion while shrapnel had pierced his left leg, several on the side of his left abdomen and his left arm. But that didn't surprise Kiba, though, what really surprised him was that the shrapnel inside his body was being pushed out with the wounds that Sakin received started wafting white smoke and began closing at an alarming rate. What the? His injured arm and leg soon began growing plates of armor on them with the shoulder gaining a spiked pauldron. Sakin's chin grew sharper as did his teeth his hair grew longer going all the way to the neck now with his bangs growing as well and gaining a horn on his forehead to the right. Get ready to die, you little shit, now that you've made me show level 2, I'm going to fucking annihilate you. With movement that Kiba could swore that was almost as fast as Lee, Sakin had appeared beside him, his right hand already drawn midway and already a blur by the time it was too close to his face. Terran Ken, Mock Fist Kiba then saw stars in his eyes as he was pummeled rapidly by Sakin's fist. Staggering back, Kiba wiped the blood dripping from his nose and mouth as he was treated with another set of pummeling from Sakin, this time he was kicked in the stomach. Terran Kyaku, mock kick. Thud, 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 thud. Kiba felt like several jackhammers were pounded on his stomach as he was sent flying and crashing into a pile of gravel making him wince as he coughed up blood. Akamaru was already by his side as the dog was growling and snarling at the sound shinobi turned demonic being. The speed demon closed in on them shoulder drawn out with the spike aiming on Kiba's head. Kiba activated his shikyaku no jutsu, four legs technique, and reacted just in time to block the spike that he caught with his two hands and were several inches away from his face. He had noticed that he had slid several paces away from his original spot with their enemy having a boost in strength as well. Akamaru had appeared just in time and tossed a smoke bomb from his mouth and landed to where Sakin and Kiba were. Gunpowder smoke erupted in a thick cloud as Kiba slipped away quick and appeared beside Akamaru while Sakin was growing more and more frustrated. That damn dog always interrupts things. Kiba then performed a set of hand seals as he took a deep breath and shouted. Kaden. Gukaku no Jutsu, Fire Release, Grand Fireball Technique. This time, Kiba gave Akamaru a red pill and said to his pet, you ready, boy. The ball of flame was already past halfway when Kiba and Akamaru charged right through it with both of them spinning like a drill. Kaden. Gurin no my, fire release, crimson lotus dance. As Kiba and Akamaru became surrounded in fire, the giant fire ball began to pick up pace as it slammed onto Sakin burning his body inside the encased armor and then being pushed back several meters as Kiba and Akamaru landed at front. Akamaru dispelled his jutsu once more and growled again when he saw the man get up with not much visible damage with very little cuts. What the fuck is that hide? I can't seem to do much damage to this guy. It's useless to even trying to pick a fight against us anyway, brat. You were dead the moment you tried to get your hands on Uchiha Sasuke. Kiba smirked. You sure about that? Sasuke may be an asshole and a prick but that guy made his loyalties clear a long time ago. This time, it was Sakin who smirked, Orochimaru-sama has one thing that Sasuke wants and that is power, power beyond his wildest imaginations, and power that you are now just witnessing. Kiba laughed at that one, who said Sasuke wants power that he knows is going to cost him. Like I said, Sasuke may be an asshole and a prick but if there's one thing that constantly remains with Sasuke is that he doesn't give out guarantees. Sakin frowned at this, what are you implying? Kiba pointed to Sakin. Why should I tell a dead man about it? Hey, those are big words coming from a brat that can't even hurt me. Kiba smirked again and let Akamaru jump on his head. Try not to blink. Kiba then concentrated chakra around his entire body as he performed a single seal with the dog above his head vanishing in a blur. Akamaru appeared in midair spinning around as Kiba shouted, Now Akamaru, dynamic marking. Akamaru then decided to empty his bladder while spinning as the dog sprayed over the sound shinobi who looked mightily pissed. What the fuck is wrong with you? Kiba didn't answer. Instead, 
he went on all fours and gave a mad dash forward sidestepped and jumped from a stone wall dashing towards it and leapt towards Akamaru. Inazuka Ryu Jujin Kanbi Henge, Inazuka style man beast combination transformation. A giant white cloud of smoke wafted in the air covering Sakan's entire visual range before a giant 20 meter tall white dog with two heads appeared out of the smoke and growling at him. Sutero, double headed wolf. Sakan assessed his situation for a few seconds. He would assume that this form of his enemy was slower than his original form. All that mass and its gigantic form would surely be. He didn't get to finish that train of thought as he had suddenly felt something ram at his entire body with the force of a gigantic summon. Sakan's world shook as if he had just experienced a disorienting earthquake. His vision spun as he rolled to the ground and felt the shocking force of being thrown like a ragdoll. His conjured armor did not help matters. Damn thing is fast. The man thought as he got up. Dirt, grime and mud now littered his uniform along with a few tatters on them. Sakan looked down. Seeing his shadow expanding to several meters forcing him to look up. That was when he saw the giant dog pouncing on him from above. Sakan jumped just in time too as the dog had stomped on the ground and destroyed the craggy floor beneath him. But that was not the end of it though. Kiba's form growled and leapt while Sakan was in midair and spun around like an angry storm of blades. Garuga, double wolf fang. Sakan could only watch in abject horror as he was shredded into two and mangled as the twister of a technique tore through him like a hot iron spear. When Kiba and Akamaru's giant two-headed wolf landed, they looked back to see Sakan in two vertically, probably mangled beyond belief. What they didn't expect was that both bodies started to regenerate. The cuts that he had inflicted earlier closed up as the two mangled pieces of his enemy began to heal and form limbs that Kiba knew couldn't be possible. Sorry you had to be awake for this, Ukan, I have no doubt you're probably pissed off by this. One of them said as the other replied. Fucking annoys me when shit like this happens. Sakan, would you mind if we tear this guy limb from limb? Sakan gave a chuckle and replied with an amused tone, no problems here bro. Then, the one on the left gave a sinister grin as Kiba suddenly realized that he had been fooled when he used his technique earlier. Ukan chuckled when he saw one of the dog heads was growling dangerously at him. You look like you just had an epiphany. The dog didn't answer and instead used his speed once more to go around the twins forming dust clouds while the two remained motionless. I have to box them in and perform one more Garuga, double wolf fang, to take them out. Akamaru can't perform another attack like that and he won't be able to move for a while. Kiba and Akamaru stomped the ground with their gigantic paws as he sent them hurtling towards the twins. The siblings merely jumped out of the way as stone and earth were sent to their direction and smashed to the floor beneath them. The gigantic canine then swiped at Sakan who dodged to the side as Kiba moved around once more and sent another swipe at Ukan who did the same. Reinforced armor or not, they were definitely not going to take the chance of having a gigantic claw capable of cleaving stone come down to their heads. Sakan and Ukan suddenly looked at each other and their proximity to one another when they had suddenly realized what their opponent was doing. He's boxed us in. And quick to follow, the gigantic wolf jumped from the trail of dust clouds into the air and spun around like a drill coming down on the twins. Garuga, double wolf fang. Sakan and Ukan looked at each other and bit their thumbs together as they slammed their hands on the ground at the same time. Kuchio's no jutsu. Rashomon, summoning technique. Rashomon. A giant gate with a demonic-looking face painted on its doors erupted from the ground, its pillars were designed with curved but sharp red spikes for an additional intimidating look the chains that dangled at its side with a piece of iron as weight on it swayed while the top, tiled with purple in design looked aged and cracking. Kiba and Akamaru couldn't stop themselves as they went straight to the center of the summoned gate and denting it in the middle as they crashed and stopped in midair while they gave a resounding metallic clang throughout the crevice. To be able to put a dent on Rashomon is quite a feat, if I do say so. Ukan looked up as the gate dispelled itself as Sakan reappeared at the other side. Both brothers jumped at the same time as the gigantic creature fell to them with their armored hands drawn back. Smash. Shikamaru vs. Tuyuya. Shikamaru was taught back then that to a shinobi, anything that he could perceive as a weapon, he must consider it to his advantage. During his free time of being locked up in his room and drawing schematics and training, he became very mindful of the many variables that surrounded him. It was actually ironic, that the more he concentrated himself, the more he became perceptive of his world. What his five senses perceive, 
his mind would process it faster than before. He reminded himself that in everyday life, he must learn that it was always a battle, a struggle to overcome. Shikmaru looked up and angled his arm to throw a pebble towards Tuyuya with a concentration that he had not had since. With a swift throw, Shikamaru vanished from his position with a single bound of his Shunshin no Jutsu, not even seeing for himself the result of his action when he threw it at his opponent. He landed on a branch, his feet not making a sound as he landed. Shikamaru plastered a single explosive note to a tree trunk obscure enough to be hidden. Need to keep the up the illusion that I'm attacking her from a distance and with stealth in mind. Keep her pinned there on the defensive to deal with my preparations. Shikamaru thought, tossing a weapon every time he used his Shunshin no Jutsu and letting fly random objects that would be enough to put Tuyuya on the defensive. You fucking pieces of trash just won't give up. Yelled Tuyuya as she bit her lip and marks of the cursed seal appeared all over her body. I'm going to take my time in killing you, shithead. Shikamaru didn't reply as all he was thinking about were executing every detailed step he could think of on the fly. Shikamaru's mind ran faster than most people, at least it was what his father explained to him when he was younger and telling him it was a trait of many of their many leaders throughout the history of their clan. It also had a side effect of those afflicted with this condition to be rather lazy. His mind simply ran at a pace where his body wouldn't be able to keep up. It played countless scenarios in his head, things that could come true and he would pick out the most logical conclusion to that end. By the time he had started to move, he had already thought of the next following steps while also conjuring up another. So caught up with his plans in taking on the sound kunoichi that when he finally stopped, he had expended majority of his tools within his pouch making him smile reluctantly as he looked down. I got so caught up in my plans that I turned this entire forest into a veritable death trap. By the time she had finished the sequence of seals, Shikamaru had already booby-trapped the entire field as smoke began to rise from the ground where Tuyuya touched on. Kuchio's no jutsu, summoning technique. Three hulking and macabre giants now stood around her. The one on her left had very long ashen gray hair and his face was drooping down on the ground, within his possession was a studded metal club, about half the size of its wielder. The next one that stood behind her was almost the exact opposite of the one to her right. This one had little to no hair on the top of its head. But its weapons weren't as big as the first one, no. This time, the weapons were thorn or claw-like weapons that were wrapped around its arms. The third and probably the most bizarre of all, was the giant on Tuyuya's left. Its face suggested that it was looking up, but he was covered from head to torso in long strips of bandages that most of its features were obscured. All three, however, shared the same thing. Their eyes were covered by a blindfold or in the case of the third by his bandages but their mouths were completely sewn shot. And Shikamaru just stood there with sweat falling from his brow and his hands trembling in both fear and anticipation. Then, he let loose three kanai from his hands and threw it straight to his opponent. Tuyuya immediately noticed the blades and had one of the three giants block it for her with a sound of her flute. Tuyuya looked up a fire burning in her eyes as she blew the flute again and this time, the three giants moved. Shikamaru simply grabbed one more kanai from his pouch and gripped it with all he could before he crouched and then jumped just as one of the giants smashed the branch that he was standing on sending splinters everywhere. Shikamaru then heard a change in the tune of the woman's flute as then the one with the thorns strapped on its hands swung its left fist back and throttled it at Shikamaru's direction. Quick on his feet, Shikamaru had already finished the sequence of seals for the Shunshin no Jutsu just as he was about to be impaled by the spikes. The giant merely pierced the branch behind Shikamaru shattering it to splinters. Shikamaru then reappeared seconds later, a few steps away from Tuyuya. The red head had to stop her flute playing just as Shikamaru made a dash for her with a kanai drawn. Shikamaru was going for a direct stab but Tuyuya evaded by sidestepping and then jumping back. Quick to follow up. Shikamaru's shadow slinked its way around the branches as it surged towards Tuyuya. The red head, knowing fully well the abilities of the Nara clan, further jumped back and landed on another branch just as Shikamaru cancelled his jutsu and letting the knife within his hands fly towards his opponent. Tuyuya leaned back and let the blade sail above her as she once more played the flute with the three giants descending upon him in complete anger. Shikamaru jumped from his branch just as the one with the thorn-wrapped hands sent a vicious strike at him that could have impaled his entire chest. The branch shattered from the impact and fell to the forest floor in a loud crackling sound. 
Shikamaru bounded off a tree branch just as he performed a timely shunshun to another side and the three giants gave chase. Shikamaru could hear the cracking and splintering of wood as the three giants lay waste on the forest but he decided to block it out. It would not do well to be encompassed by fear with the current altercation. So far, he still has yet to turn the tables around against his opponent. Shikamaru smirked when he was entering familiar territory and made a sharp turn to the right with a perfectly timed and well-executed shunshun. There were no traces of smoke nor leaves left behind as he did so and seemingly vanished from sight once again. The one with the claws was the first to arrive to the last place Shikamaru was seen. It then left forward in order to continue its search. Boom. 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 A series of explosions rocked the forest as a large cloud of dust and debris escaped into the sky as the flames and the force of the explosion burned and mangled the body of the yellow giant. It fell down in a heap to the ground as its left leg was literally blown off from the explosion. It gave a low and earth-shaking groan before it fell to the ground as the two remaining giants looked around. I seriously didn't expect these things would be her main avenues in fighting. I've never seen her once displaying her skill other than a few use of the kanai and some taijutsu. It probably means this is probably one of their best kept secrets. Shikamaru landed on another branch and crouched as he observed the two remaining mobile giants. Back to Tayuya, she scowled, one of her giants were taken down by traps. Her opponent was a crafty son of a bitch. He would limit the use of his jutsus and expend all of his equipment first before using his chakra. To Tayuya, that meant one thing. Her opponent did not have reserves enough to stand a long-term battle. He may be a crafty bastard, but he lacked stamina and the chakra enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with her. If he was struggling in a fight like this, then imagine to what he might be if she used the second stage of her cursed seal. She sensed the chakra presence of the giant that her opponent had taken down and saw that he wasn't dispelled. She smirked inwardly, a little plan formed in her head. A battle of attrition, eh? Then let's play. Inducing fatigue would be the best way to go in taking care of this little shit. Tiyuya then changed the tempo and tune of her flute as it became more feverish, faster and higher in pitch. Her form changed, the cloth and headband wrapped on her head fell was torn up by the horns that had protruded from her head. The sclera on her eyes turned black as her iris turned yellow, the full effect of the cursed seal manifesting itself on her. Shukyoku Daikusetsu. Makio no Ran Finale. The Ninth Movement. Revolt of the Demon World. The sewn mouths of the three giants were then forcibly opened and three grotesque translucent apparitions exited from the oral cavity of the abominations. They wriggled in midair, swaying with the wind slightly before they opened their mouths showing sharp rows of teeth. It groaned as saliva dripped from its mouth and Shikamaru could swear to himself that he had never seen anything so gross and putrid in his whole life. He leaned down slightly and was suddenly surprised that the ghost-like things lashed out at him like a vicious viper. Shikamaru jumped from his position backwards as the beings coiled in midair and chased after him like a rabid dog. These things are sensitive to movement. Shit. Shikamaru cursed as he landed on another branch and descended to the ground below. The best way to stop this is to go direct to the source. The sound of her flute tells them how and where to attack while the ghosts give her feedback when they detect movement. Shikamaru had fully understood the mutual benefits of what Tiyuya and her summons could do and he was hard-pressed to admit that he was the one who was in a disadvantage against this opponent. A ghost had appeared below and ascended upwards straight to Shikamaru. In great surprise, Shikamaru had little time to effectively dodge the attack and it grazed his shoulder. Shikamaru landed on the ground, feeling a bit winded as he cursed inwardly once more. I see, so that jutsu drains physical strength. She's trying to tire me out. It was then that Shikamaru had realized the situation he was in when he gained the necessary amount of information concerning this technique. That gives me all the necessary time I need. Shikamaru checked his equipment as he jumped away when another set of ghosts appeared above him. The boy simply bowed and vanished with a simple and unflashy shunshin no jutsu, body flicker skill. Shikamaru had landed at a fair distance as he sat down and began to think in his usual pose. The Chunin grinned as he began thinking of plan after plan, after plan. The scenarios in his head playing out as he factored in every single thing he had seen from his enemy. He grinned, his eyes still closed and he stood up. He checked his equipment and found out he was already running out. 
There were only several more Kanai and Shuriken in his pouch as well as explosive notes dangerously close into the single digits. He still had some traps ready, and although it was a complete waste for them with the enemy preferring to be stationary now, Shikamaru quickly took this opportunity as a sign of his widening options. To dispel those things I need to stop her. But first I need to get those creatures away from her. Back with Tayuya, she scowled. Even with a shunshun, the jutsu shouldn't be enough to slip out of her technique. Unless that shitty little fucker has something close to a jikuakan ninjutsu, that little shit shouldn't have gotten away that easy. That or his use of the jutsu is leagues above the average shinobi. Boom. Her thoughts were put on an abrupt halt as she heard a resounding explosion just north of her. Reacting quickly, she had sent her ghosts to see what had caused the explosion. It could just be a false flag, signaling her that the crafty little bastard was trying to get away with a red herring, but she knew not to take her chances when something like this happens. And sure enough, her intuition saved her when Shikamaru had appeared just a few short seconds later with a kanai drawn. Tiyuya sidestepped the attack and played her flu once more. The black ogre descended on the shadow user quick as Shikamaru slipped by his attacker by a backflip down below and descending into the ground and letting go his kanai to a trunk. Tiyuya hadn't noticed the grin in Shikamaru's face as he looked back to the ogre before it was shredded by a web of strong, tensile and almost invisible set of ninja wire that a shinobi of only Shikamaru's size can exit. Of course, the weight of the ogre couldn't be supported enough and the ninja wire had to give way, not even reaching a quarter of the ogre's flesh. Tiyuya scowled, her opponent had learned something from their encounter with Kidumaru. Maybe that's why they've gotten here. This little fucker can adapt and make sound battlefield judgments. He's not a pushover. But of course, Shikamaru was counting for that as the next series of events played perfectly into his hands. Multiple branches broke off, some the size of a fully grown adult, laced with explosives and wrapped itself around the ogre before falling to the ground and exploding in a fiery blaze. Tiyuya gritted her teeth as Shikamaru landed on the ground and proceeded to dash away again before he was chased again by a chakra apparition. Tiyuya played her flute feverishly, her target slipping away. It took several more minutes of Tiyuya chasing after her prey when an idea crossed her mind. Her eyes wordlessly narrowed on her opponent, still with the flute in her lips. Inwardly, she was smiling. As Shikamaru decided to go for another trap, he was suddenly routed when he saw the chakra apparition heading right at his general direction, the chunin cursed his luck and jumped the final ogre now going at him at a general direction, forcing Shikamaru to take another way to his trap. He wouldn't be able to succeed though, as the ghost kept blocking his way with the ogre pressuring him from behind. Having no way to escape, his equipment virtually depleted and chakra running out, he had no choice but to keep evading and find a way to get out of her range and trigger another trip long enough so he could get close to her and stop her from playing her flute. After another set of interception and pressure, Shikamaru noticed a pattern in the woman's attacks and scowled. She's forcing me in a specific direction. Shit, I can't avoid this scenario. Shikamaru thought in a panic as backup plans began formulating in his head. He had landed in a familiar looking place and stopped when he noticed that he was well within the range of Tiyuya. He looked back and saw the bandaged ogre chasing after him as Tiyuya closed in with a kanai brandished. Shikamaru had no other choice and with only two flash grenades left, he turned back and tossed it behind him well within Tiyuya's sights. The woman's eyes widened as she was suddenly engulfed with light, her last ogre couldn't be stopped as Shikamaru performed one more well-timed shunshun. When the light cleared, Tiyuya stood there, unmoving, her shadow stretched as it connected to Shikamaru, her flute laid down on the hard wood. Throughout it all, Shikamaru was breathing heavily, the bags under his eyes showed the fatigue he was having. Cage main no jutsu, shadow imitation technique, success. Tiyuya simply scoffed it off and replied, You can't hold this for long, one way or another, I'm going to break free from this jutsu and then. She trailed off and released her killing intent. I'll be sure to lop your fucking head off. Shikamaru then spoke sweat dripping from his brow, you underestimate me. Ever since the start of the fight, you kept selling me short. You decided to toy with me instead, hoping that you wouldn't have to face your teammate. You tried to drag this out as much as you can, unfortunately for you. Shikamaru then weaved three more signs as several hands of shadows began to creep up onto Yuya, spiraling upwards towards his neck. You made a mistake by trying to fight me in a battle of attrition. In such cases, I always find my shortcuts. 
Then, he invoked the name of the jutsu, Cage Kyubi Shibari no Jutsu, Shadow Strangulation Technique. The process was slow, and Tuyuya could still greatly resist the jutsu that was trying to seal her fate. Shikamaru cursed. If this kept up, he would run out of chakra in just even trying to reach for the woman's neck. Lee, it was courteous of a warrior to give out his name at the start of the battle. It was the kind of etiquette that he had learned from his sensei. When warriors trade blow, be it fists or blades, they must show signs of acknowledgement for their opponents. So that when one of them is slain, the victor can remember his opponent. And judging from the man's posture and the way he was looking at him with no hint of emotion at all, it would seem that the man was making an assessment of him, observing him to determine what kind of fighter he was. The he heard the sound of bones crackling, as if they were being rubbed together in intense friction before a pair of spikes protruded from his arms, the white-haired boy introduced himself, as a sign of courtesy to the person he was about to kill. I am Kimamaro, the last of the Kagaya clan and the leader of the Sound Five. Rock Lee responded in kind, I am Rock Lee, the mighty green beast of Konoha and a genius of hard work. Kimamaro didn't seem to nod but he would introduce himself by planting his spiked right palm straight to the boy's face. Lee reacted. His body responded to the speed that Kimamaro was demonstrating, he had seen faster, fiercer, stronger and harsher. It was no secret that Guy was a monstrous ninja, his prowess in taijutsu was nearly unmatched by any other being in Konoha and perhaps beyond. Even the famed Hyuga clan, with its strict tradition and overwhelming pride, would respect his sensei's prowess in close-quarter combat although sometimes begrudgingly. And like the ebb and flow of a stream of water, Lee dodged thrust after thrust that Kimamaro would do to him. But instead of growing frustrated, the white-haired boy simply grew persistent with his attacks. Yanagi no Mai, Dance of the Willow, was his first dance and those who would be able to keep up with his widespreading and incredibly risky maneuvers were shinobi not of normal caliber. For a boy of this age to keep up with him was a feat in of itself. It meant he was facing a shinobi that wasn't run of the mill. But still, he still had very little to show using the first dance and decided to make it more interesting by adding more spiked appendages all around his body. Sharp curved blades of bone sprouted from his elbows, shoulders and knees as he spun, jabbed, charged and jumped. Yet still, Rock Lee found them slow, though he seemed to have picked up the pace. Lee leaned forward and ducked when Kimamaro attacked with his knee. The spike missed Lee by a very small margin as the boy dashed forward and counter-attacked. He jabbed his fist on the side of the knees stopping Kimamaro's momentum who looked surprised at such as Lee followed up with a sweeping kick. Kimamaro jumped and backed off just as Rock Lee was about to perform a Konoha Senpu leaf whirlwind. Lee resumed his stance, Kimamaro was watching in anticipation. So far, he had seen a very good amount of reflex, his movements had little waste in them and he dodged with as little energy as possible. He could also give out a good counterattack and attacked in a very sound manner. A taijutsu user, Kimamaro thought. There was little doubt in his mind now that this person was good in close quarter combat. From the way Lee moved when he attacked, the speed, the reaction time, to the way he performed that very efficient counter, it showed just how much honed his senses were. From the way he fights, it is safe to assume that he lacks in a certain field. Genjutsu, maybe, or ninjutsu, Kimamaro then pointed his fingers at Rock Lee who remained alert just as Kimamaro let loose a rain of ten small bones straight at him. Lee had dodged, and it took him by surprise that Kimamaro would resort to such a thing. Kimamaro then lunged at him and only with reflexes of one such as Lee could he have a moment to dodge as Kimamaro tried to stab him at the chest and at his side with a knee strike. Lee deflected the blow, making it harmless as he took a step towards Kimamaro and elbowed the boy straight to the stomach. Kimamaro flew back as Lee followed it up by throwing his weights towards his opponent who had fired ten finger bullets at him earlier on. Kimamaro was surprised when his Teshi Senden, ten finger drilling bullets, did nothing to the pair of weights and found himself suddenly weighed down by the offending object as they broke the blades on his hands and elbows. Certainly the cloth that bound the things could be destroyed but its contents were practically indestructible. So when Kimamaro landed with his blades of bone breaking upon impact and the ground shattering from the sheer weight of the objects, Lee had appeared right on top of him and stomped his chest enough for the ground beneath them to shatter from the force of the drop. Lee jumped back just as a few spikes of bone tried to impale his legs. He looked back at Kimamaro and frowned. The boy got up, obviously dirtied but not exactly harmed enough. 
You have done well against one of my dances. I have five in total. Can you actually bring them all out? He loosened the sleeve on his left shoulder as bone crept up from it. Kimamaro pulled it out, forming a strange sword with it. This is my second dance, Tsubaki no Mai, Dance of the Camellia. Lee was quick to react, as Kimamaro suddenly attacked at an angle almost impossible to do so. He was nearly caught off guard, but with his honed reflexes, he was able to dodge, if even barely. A scratch had made its way on his shoulder, slicing his suit open and leaving a small trickle of blood in its wake as the bone was retracted. Lee then took two leaps back and resumed his stance, noting that his enemy had upped the ante and increased his speed as well as his attack range. That thrust he did earlier shouldn't have made contact from its earlier trajectory, but Kimamaro had changed his movements to the very last second and adjusted his thrust well. It was subtle but it was deadly. He had seen enough sword maneuvers from Tenten that he could tell just how an armed person would attack. It was also one of her little tricks when performing thrusts and it is almost unavoidable if you didn't expect it. But Lee was honed by his sensei and teammates to fight with a disadvantage. And he learned to fight tooth and nail out of sheer determination and overpowering skill with his fists alone. He is not one to be taken lightly at any cost. Lee then reached for his backpack and grabbed a pair of tonfas made out of iron wood. Iron wood was heavy, but they were tough enough to endure blade attacks. It would not be easy to cut through such a material. No sword, unless enhanced by wind chakra, could ever break them in one slice. Guy taught him how to use a tonfa and explained to Lee the importance of being well protected against armed opponents. The Goken was typically bare-handed but it did not mean that its discipline was strictly limited to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat only, weapons could also be used. It was uncommon, but indeed, the Goken truly had instances of using weapons and these weapons mixed perfectly with its tenacious and explosive fighting style. And then, Kimamaro attacked once again, in a very difficult angle once more with a thrust ready. But Lee was prepared for him this time. When the attack came, Lee parried it with his right arm and the tonfa taking the brunt of the attack not even once splintering, redirecting Kimamaro's attack and with his left bashed the offending arm with the short end of the tonfa forcing Kimamaro to let go of his bone sword and Lee following it up with an upward kick straight to Kimamaro's chin. Kimamaro dodged by leaning back but Lee was faster, his feet were quicker and he attacked much more frequently. Lee vanished from his position as fast as if he was performing a real shunshun and slammed both his tonfas on Kimamaro's left side as he reappeared, his feet sliding to the grassy land as the last of the Kagaya clan skidded back. Lee did not let up as he vanished once more and reappeared just to Kimamaro's back already in a spin and unleashed a massively strong and furious Konoha Senpu that caused the air itself around him to blow up a gust rustling the grass around them. The speed that he had used was something Kimamaro should have expected, yet still found surprising, it was as if Lee had turned into a veritable wild storm, a fierce monsoon raging at a coastline. Kimamaro recovered and got up as he once more produced a sword out of bone from his left shoulder. He looked on in silent trepidation as he had realized that this green beast, as ridiculous as he looked and sounded, was an ever-fitting nickname. He pointed the tip of his blade towards his opponent wordlessly and wind rustled between them, it held and blew all around them before the both of them vanished. Kimamaro and Lee clashed and the sound of bone and wood echoed around as both of them entered into each other's range and began to test each other's defense against each of their weapons. Kimamaro tested Lee's evasive and countermeasures against his attacks that were outside normal angles and pushed Lee's defensive skills to their brink. He would try and debilitate Lee by using afterimages but Lee was just too well adjusted for such high-speed combat that it was useless to catch him off guard in a battle of speed which Kimamaro found the hard way when Lee smashed his tonfa to Kimamaro's face with a straight jab and a swipe. For Lee's instance, he had been forced to do more defensive maneuvers and tested Kimamaro's patience. He was at a clear disadvantage with height and reach, the instance that he could leave an attack on Kimamaro's face was a lucky shot at best when Kimamaro had leaned forward far too eagerly and Lee took advantage of that position. Kimamaro however, was quick to recover and Lee could not follow up any debilitating blows when Kimamaro decided to play more with his technique and began attacking areas that would otherwise leave him unguarded when he tried to block or dodge. The result was Lee getting some shallow cuts on his right cheek, the left side of his neck, his right forearm, his right leg and left thigh. Both ninjas slid back, away from each other kicking up dirt and uprooting grass as they did so. You've done quite well for a shinobi of your level. However, 
Himamaro then loosened his other sleeve and revealed on his chest, the cursed seal of earth. I have gauged enough of your ability to know that you cannot beat me. Marks of the seal soon spreads over a small part of his skin as Kimimaro's right hand and fingers twitched and contorted for bones to pop up from his right hand. Your attacks are angular, like your name. But Taijutsu alone puts you in a disadvantage. Boom. Both of them looked at the sound of the explosion and saw the container destroyed with smoke wafting from the epicenter. Kimimaro looked on in anticipation while Lee did as well, although much more nervous. Kimimaro then remarked. The vessel of Orochimaru-sama has finally awakened. With this, he can go to where Orochimaru-sama is while I stay behind and deal with you. I have sought out to complete my purpose. Sasuke appeared from the smoke, grayish to white hair spiked all the way to his lower back and skin darkened with nails as sharp as claws. Strapped behind him was a sword, a true katana and he reached out for it. I am no one's vessel. Sasuke muttered, the features of his hair receding and turning up to black. A click was all that was heard when Sasuke pulled out the blade from his own mother, Murakumo no Ken, cloud gathering sword. Instantly, Kimimaro was on guard and with his own reflexes blocked a sword strike that would have completely bisected him from the waist down. For this reason, it had somehow enraged Kimimaro. Traitor. After the grace given to you by Orochimaru sama, you spat on his offer of power. Sasuke scoffed at it with an emotionless and unforgiving tone as his fully matured Sharingan came to life with three tomo spinning per eye. Power. Power can be obtained anywhere. What is best is to hone it, to make it bend to your will, control it. You, who sought power to an outside influence and then be reliant on it, have no right to lecture me about power. The temptation of it is alluring, yes, but an offer like that is too good to be true. There are consequences to be paid and I am no stranger to such a thing. Sasuke and Kimimaro jumped back from each other with the Uchiha now standing beside Rock Lee. I do not have such delusions as to come and seek Orochimaru for something that will hold me back in the end. I have understood it. Orochimaru will only make me strong to a certain point where I can be easily controlled and where my abilities will remain to that point. I will never be strong enough to face Itachi if I were to follow Orochimaru. You used Orochimaru-sama's offer for your own wretched gains. How dare you make light of his offerings? Kimimaro was now angered. Sasuke had only used them for this moment. It was utterly humiliating especially for someone like him, who had considered Orochimaru as his guiding light. Just as he is willing to use me as his container and vessel, I will use his offer as a chance to see what it can do and how it is done. I must admit, it is indeed alluring but in the end, this is meaningless if I were to die. So I will say it to you now, Sasuke pointed his blade at Kimimaro and a flashback of Naruto's mangled corpse entered into his head. His teeth clenched as he said the words that he had wanted for a long time. There is no honor in death. Kimimaro growled at this, everything up until now, he had given everything for his lord and master and to see a boy like this discard every wonderful offer from his master and stomping it in such a vicious manner was quite infuriating. Sasuke-kun. Lee interrupted. The Uchiha turned to Lee as the older of the two said, you have become strong. Sasuke merely turned his gaze back to Kimimaro and said, Konoha is my home, a place where my clan was slaughtered by a man driven insane by power, it holds within me a kind of pain that will never go away, but also a pain that will make me strong. Sasuke then used a handed seal of the tiger before touching the flat side of the blade from the base onto the tip. And for that reason alone, I will protect it, just as what my teammate would have wanted me to. Flames ignited from the blade, swaying and dancing wildly with the wind as he invoked the name of the technique that hasn't been heard since the time of Uchiha Shisui. Uchiha Ryu. Higasa no my Uchiha style, Halo Dance. Kimimaro charged, bone sword drawn, Sasuke reacted, Sharingan tracing every bit of movement coming from Kimimaro. He parried an overhead slash downwards with ease of both his hands and countered with a wide horizontal swing to Kimimaro's chest and a single step. Kimimaro leaned back, but a trail of conflagration seared through his skin so quick that he had no time to guard with his bones. The searing heat from his skin wafted a pungent odor to his nose and he looked down, seeing the cooked flesh that Sasuke had just inflicted. Kimimaro looked back and saw Sasuke's image flicker before vanishing and diving down at him in an instant. Kimimaro managed to completely dodge this time and pointed his fingers directly at Sasuke. Lee was quick to cover Sasuke by stepping in just as fast and smashed his tonfa on the bone user's arms. 
Himamaro slid back, protecting his form with his arms with blood spilling from one of his spiked bones on his forearms. Lee winced. He looked at his arms and noticed that some had gashes on them, not deep enough, but certainly noticeable. Himamaro had just used his third dance, Karamatsu no Mai, Dance of the Larch. In turn, Kimamaro had to jump back as Sasuke decided to capitalize on his attention to Lee by appearing just beside him and swinging his katana sideways with flames trailing from the tip of his blade. The conflagration missed as Kimamaro leaned back and immediately countered by recoiling his back and pushing the bone sword forward, aiming for Sasuke's shoulders to disable him from using any attacks or jutsu. Unfortunately, Sasuke's form wavered into thin air as if he had just pierced steam as Kimamaro's senses took over when Sasuke had appeared from above with sword already in mid-swing downwards. Kimamaro jumped back, just as the burning sword struck down to where his body was supposed to be earlier. He jumped further back once more, now eyeing both the green-clad taijutsu user and his master's new chosen vessel. His Tsubaki no Mai would be useless against these two, Lee had the speed to keep up and the skill for him to counter any closed-ranged attacks. His mastery over his taijutsu was indeed superb, but he was weak against everything else. All Kimamaro needed was an opening against Lee and he doubted the boy could seriously land a blow with just his taijutsu alone. Then Kimamaro turned to look at Sasuke and he felt his blood boil at the notion of Sasuke simply using Orochimaru for his own gain. He couldn't fathom how someone could so willingly throw away the grace of another person, the chance to become stronger beyond anyone's imagination. Yet he couldn't help but feel that it was exactly this reason why Sasuke was chosen. Not only was the boy skilled, with his movement that could be hearkened to a deceitful mirage in the desert, Sasuke also had the same facets of that of his master, his cold-blooded demeanor in many things, his presumed ruthlessness and his willingness to strike down anyone that crossed his path. They all cultivated in one thing, Sasuke was the prodigy Orochimaru had been searching for all his life. With access to the Sharingan, it would be no doubt that his master would attain new heights for his goals. And soon, an epiphany came to Kimamaro. He could not fail his master especially now of all times. Even if his body broke, he would bring back Uchiha Sasuke to Otogaku and he would do it as his last offering to the person who has taken him. The curse mark on his chest started spreading further and the bones in his body began twitching and snapping like twigs. Sasuke watched in morbid fascination as Kimamaro started growing ivory spikes of bone out of his body like a porcupine. The marks of the cursed seal started spreading all over him entering into the first stage. For now, Sasuke had to keep his Sharingan on his opponent and try to intercept anything if Kimamaro decided to attack his current teammate. Rock Lee scowled. It was as if with each new and escalating odds stacking against the last of the Kagaya clan, the boy would come up with something with his bones and come out stronger for it if he couldn't be taken down. So in order to bring this one down, they would need to strike Kimamaro down fast and make sure of an effective and crippling blow. He only knew of one thing that could penetrate such a defense. Ura Renge. Since his recovery after the defeat from the hands of Sabaku no Gara, Rock Lee was adamant on mastering and unlocking the rest of the eight gates. Guy had reciprocated. He had trained Lee in a much more intensive training regimen that concerned the Gokan. He now had to punch faster but also harder, he had to kick harder that the air itself could serve as a platform or a weapon for him. But most of all, Guy had reminded him what being a truly splendid shinobi meant. A truly strong and splendid shinobi, no, a true taijutsu master must step away from the bounds of his own style and must search for new horizons once he has attained complete mastery of one style. The Gokan for all its strength and ability, is still only one style. To become a true taijutsu master, you must be your own master. Those were Gai Sensei's words to him. And it resonated within himself to find something more than just the Gokan, more than just this style that has stubbornly defined him since his entire shinobi career. Gai Sensei, I am still too far away to master the Gokan. Though you have paved the way for me to grow still past the limits of my own style, even with this knowledge, I must continue to climb this mountain that you have set me on and one that I accept fully. Even without your permission. Sasuke-kun, please back me up, I will tap into the power of the Hachiman eight gates. I will use it, I will use the Hachiman to win. Hachiman Tonko, Daichi Mon, Kaiman, Kai, eight gates opening, the first gate, gate of opening, release. Wind began picking up around him, 
chakra swirled and created an updraft as the release of his own body's limiters opened the floodgates of his internal energy out into the open. Sasuke stepped in between Lee and Kimamaro shielded himself from the sudden rush of power. Sasuke had to look at Lee in surprise. He had once questioned Lee's legitimacy of being a ninja because of his fixation to Taijutsu being one of the unfortunate of not having witnessed his battle against Sabaku no Gara. He had not realized that Lee can tap into something so dramatically powerful. Human. Kai, Gate of Healing. Release. Lee's hair started spiking upwards and the ground around him shattered and cratered beneath his feet. Simon. Kai, Gate of Life. Release. The blood vessels within him expanded and his heart began beating faster and stronger, compensating for such a sudden boost of adrenaline. Blood was leaking everywhere in his body, reaching every cell and nourishing them completely. Kimamaro chose to attack before Lee would choose to unleash another limiting gate. He fired another set of his bone bullets as Sasuke's Sharingan had predicted earlier. A wave of fire met the bullets and completely incinerated the ten-finger bones as Sasuke stood composed, his Sharingan seemingly glowing and three Tomo spinning around in his irises. It was at this stage that Lee chose to attack. Unlike Sasuke's finesse with the illusion of a mirage being left in his wake, or a hazy distorted afterimage, Lee's speed was much more like a cannonball fired from an extremely and absurdly powerful cannon. He was not much of a man with such a force as that of a freight train or a herd of rampaging oxen. It was more like an uncontrolled, untamable force of nature. And when he crashed his fist at Kimamaro's face, it felt like a whirlwind had just compressed into a fist that it became dense enough to shatter and break the protruding bones that attacked Kimamaro with brute strength alone. Kimamaro looked back as he was suddenly thrown away from his position by several meters with the ground forming a small trench in between them. Blood dripped from his nose and it was bent at an odd angle, it felt slightly painful, but one Kimamaro could just scoff at. Far stronger and faster, my fists shall become lightning itself. Shoman. K.A.I., Gate of Pain. Release. Lee could feel the pain slowly encroaching from his toes crawling up to his knees, climbing and climbing still. But unlike before, the pain was getting much less excruciating than his earlier uses. Lee punched the air itself, a shockwave of pure condensed air escaped from his fist. His hand punched the air so hard that it formed such a powerful wave that Kimamaro couldn't defend against in time before he was blown back once more as Lee disappeared and reappeared in midair. Toman. K.A.I., Gate of Limit. Release. Then, there was an explosion of power. Boom. The trees rustled when Lee created such turbulence around him. His chakra, incapable of manifesting regularly was now beginning to burn bright and visible to the naked eye. The overwhelming sensation had struck him with an incredible rush as he did before when he fought Gara. Kimamaro got up quickly. His instincts of battle alerted him of how much of an improvement the green-clad genin showed in such a very short amount of time something that indeed was terrifying to witness now was. The air was riddled thick with chakra, overflowing with Lee's resolve and inner strength. Kimamaro wasted no time. He charged bone sword drawn and charged at Lee with his own enhanced speed from the cursed seal and additional simple ninja techniques. He was surprised Lee and Sasuke kept up with him either with refined and honed senses due to countless battles and the prowess of the eyes given to the Uchiha. Either way, it had put him in a strange predicament. Of one he could personally handle, but two debilitating speedsters were not something to be taken lightly. Kimamaro began thinking of a way to defend and counterattack such an incredibly destructive and unpredictable technique. As he got up, he heard the crackling of lightning, the sound of a thousand birds chirping upon the open sky. A surge of lightning escaped from Sasuke's form as he attacked Kimamaro to the side, his sword drawn. Kimamaro wasted no time to evade. Orochimaru had informed him of Sasuke's affinities with fire and lightning. He had a basic understanding of Sasuke's skills. But he didn't expect Sasuke to have made a multitude of new skills quite suddenly during these past several months. It was as if the spirit of Uchiha Shisui was alive within Sasuke himself. Sasuke's blade carved the ground, zigzagging as the blade tore the earth asunder from his charge with his Raiden Chakra. Kimamaro was already waiting as Sasuke attacked him with the sword coated with lightning before disappearing in a mirage and reappearing behind him. With the sword of lightning lighting up in his hand, Sasuke turned and performed an upward slash that Kimamaro forced himself out of by performing a counter-attack forcing Sasuke to stop his attack and also jump back. Kimamaro had turned just in time as Lee had tried to punch the air hard enough again to send a shockwave at him. 
It was small, the size of a medium-sized pipe and concentrated that it punctured the tree behind him with a perfectly carved hole the size of a closed fist. Kimamaro fired five finger bullets at Li who weaved out of the way and charged at full speed. Kimamaro then grabbed another bone sword from his right shoulder this time and tossed one like a shuriken at Li who jumped just in time as Kimamaro appeared in front of him at speeds both he and Sasuke found surprising. With a horizontal slash at midair, he had almost torn Li asunder if it were not for his enhanced reflexes. Li then back flipped. He had put a distance between him and Kimamaro unintentionally. Li then got back up and charged at the guy head on leaving behind a ground that caved in from Li's forceful movement. Li had realized that with the pacing of his speed, he didn't need to widen his stride. He can charge with as minimal and little wasted movement as possible. By just using his feet more to maintain his speed and narrow his strides, Li maintained his top peak velocity with more control, more avenues of movement with each step into without the loss of his most useful weapon. His speed. Kimamaro drew his right hand back, bone sword pointed at Li and stabbed the boy to his face, but what he had just hit, was nothing more than air. Kimamaro looked surprised, and for a silent moment, he had watched as Li looked like he had split in two and combined once more behind him, to his unprotected side, a fist drawn back below his waist, held back by his left hand and the pressure of air filling in. Li had created a technique all on his own. And Li punched Kimamaro square on his back and at that very focal point, the air pressure was released and the shockwave of Li's fist hit Kimamaro at its highest peak. Smash. It had been a long time since Kimamaro had experienced quite a pain. To hear his bones break from the sheer force of having a small mountain smash directly on to his side made him curious as to how long ago had he heard hearing his bones succumb to such a great amount of pressure. The air whistled as he was sent careening and he crashed to the opposite side, the ground was entrenched once more but soon cratered as Kimamaro dug further and further into the ground. Lee panted heavily. The strain of using the gates was beginning to show. Ura Renge was less specific of an attack but more of a state of well-being. He had just used a much more concentrated version of it, a mere grasp of what the power of the eight gates could bestow upon a true master of the Gokan. His usage of the gates faded, his body returning to normal, pain racked his body so much it was difficult to even stand up. Sasuke appeared beside him, sword still drawn, waiting in anticipation of what might happen next. If there was one thing that he learned from Anbu, is that death should be confirmed with a corpse. Many special ops members fail to see this rule and many fell for such an old trick. He could not let his guard down even for a minute. It was then that Kimamaro had popped up from the ground, now in a more monstrous form, six curved spiked bone now protrude from his back, as large as steel pipes. His skin was now darker in shade as was his hair, with markings around his face black as well as the sclerae of his eyes with the irises themselves turning to a yellow color. Along his spine were more protrusions of bone, jagged and sharp. The mere sight of it was intimidating to any other shinobi. To his flank, there was the familiar ivory-white color of bone, covering what was supposed to be his skin. The disruption to his skin was noticeable, the layers were exposed outside. Lee and Sasuke would imagine that the kind of pain their opponent was in now must be excruciating, yet he made no face to show the pain he was in. It was either incredible willpower, or Kimamaro was drugged enough that he couldn't feel pain. Kimamaro had grabbed a protrusion in the middle of his upper back and at the base of his neck, he twitched slightly as he pulled his spine out. The bony protrusions, the spinous processes just to the side of the bone itself turned sharp and almost claw-like, perfect for hooking an enemy without the need for trapping them, in between these sharp and dangerous set of bones were cartilaginous discs that made the weapon flexible. Tesenka no Mai, Dance of the Clematis. The most loyal of Orochimaru's subjects then attacked. He swung the whip-like weapon sideways to Lee and Sasuke and in a matter of seconds, closed the gap between them and the weapon. Sasuke had enough time to dodge as Lee jumped backward as much as he can. The weapon, however, still managed to graze his stomach as Lee flinched and stumbled back and fell on his rump. Kimamaro took this opportunity and decided to finish Lee off. He cracked the bone whip upwards and swung it down, intending to slice of Lee's face off and tear it away. Lee looked up. His body couldn't move due to the pain that he was in. He had sustained enough injuries that could warrant fatigue and close to shock. The shadow of the bone whip descended on him with Sasuke telling him to get out of the way echoed through his head. But he simply couldn't just will himself to get out when his own body was failing to move him. Get out of there, Lee. 
Sasuke shouted once more, charging his hand with a chidori and activating his own speed, hoping that he would get to kill Kimamaro before the man could kill Lee. Shit, I won't make it. Just then, two shuriken flew through the air with the sound of an angry buzz saw escaping from them and grains of sand wrapped around Lee gently before pulling him away from the grassy floor and from the range of the bone whip that would have torn him to shreds. The shuriken pierced the bone armor like it was nothing and it was severed in the middle by the two shuriken then slicing through a tree trunk and some stone before finally embedding itself on the ground. Sasuke stopped his charge, his chidori fading from his hands as he looked back. He saw Gara standing tall with his arms crossed, grains of sand trailed the air as it traced back to his gourd. But what surprised him was the appearance of another person. The other one with Gara had a mop of messy blonde hair with the sideburns going past his cheek as his whole face was wrapped around in bandages. But he could still see those fierce blue eyes that could bore through the soul. He wore the forehead protector proudly on his head and the Konoha standard uniform and flak vest made him look all too familiar. Sasuke's Sharingan eyes widened, the last time he had seen this image was more than three months ago. Then he heard voice familiar to him escaping from this boy and he asked, what's up, bastard? Surprised to see your dead teammate. Elsewhere, a two-headed wolf descended to the ground after crashing against Orochimaru's ultimate defense. A pair of identical siblings, grotesquely looking in appearance, was about to deliver a fatal blow in midair when a swarm of insects had intercepted one of them in their flight path while a deluge of Sanban headed straight for another. Sakan shielded himself with his armor as the poison needles simply bounced off while Ukan dropped to the floor and rolled on the ground as he went for the small body of water to try and ward off the swarm of insects that were attacking him. Sakan growled as the two-headed wolf dispelled as Kiba held Akamaru in his arms who turned to the side only to find two shinobi, one of Suna and the other from Konoha. He could only make out the one who he was most familiar with at the time. S. Shino. Indeed there was Shino, hands in his coat pocket that was now open with a small green scarf wrapping itself around Shino's face that it covered his mouth instead of the coat's high collar with the arms of said scarf dangling loosely just above his lower back. Kiba saw the green chunin vest beneath the coat and a small backpack wrapped around him with his hands held out. Better to keep your eyes on your enemy, newbie. Konkuro said to Kiba with a smirk as the Suna ninja pulled two puppets from his back. The one on the puppeteer's left looked familiar. The one on his right looked big and ant-like. Its face was longer and its mouth showed a sharper and more numerous set of teeth than the first puppet and this one had a more rotund body than the first. They crackled both loudly and it sent shivers down Kiba's spine when Konkuro smirked. Kiba, I suggest you evacuate Akamaru for now seeing as he can't move. We will deal with this problem ourselves. Swarms of insects soon floated around Shino buzzing loudly as they flew around. Sakan chuckled quietly as he said, aren't we the confident one? Shino merely adjusted his glasses and said, it is not conjecture for us to know of the outcome of this battle but rather, it is the simple truth. Make no mistake, you will be beaten. Just who the hell are you brats to make that kind of statement? Shinobi allies, Suna and Konoha, plain and simple. Konkuro answered who had sent Karasu towards Sakan followed by Shino from behind. Karasu disassembled and out came multitude of poisoned blades that went towards Sakan. Shino vanished in a blur as his bugs dispersed and reappeared just behind Sakan before delivering a spinning kick. Sakan managed to block just in time just as he was sent straight to the trail of poison knives. Sakan managed to shield and dodge and landed in one piece on the rocky ground but not before seeing Kiba performing a hand seal with smirk on his face. Below him, an explosive tag was set off blowing him away from his original position and right into the arms or in this case, into the container of Konkuro's new puppet, Kurori, Black Ant. Sakan. Ukan was about to go after the puppeteer when Shino had intercepted him with a punch. But Shino was surprised, Ukan had just vanished when he had hit him. What? Shino asked and Ukan appeared to his side. Unfortunate for you, I've infested you with my ability. Now your cells and your body is my body, I can absorb all your body's nutrients, all your chemicals needed to function and use it to heal myself while slowly killing you. You've got no escape. Shino raised an eyebrow. You have seemed to have made a terrible error. Just then, Kurori had closed itself and trapped Sakan inside. Then, the Abarame continued, I already have other organisms living inside me. Kuro Higi. Kiki Apatsu, Black Secret Technique. Konkuro shouted and Karasu, 
who had disassembled itself earlier, positioned its parts around Kurori and their blades pointing to the open slots of Kurori. And just as they are capable of taking away poison, they can also inject it on their unsuspecting target. Ukan's eyes widened. If you do that, you'll die. Shino merely gave a reply as if he wasn't even concerned with his own death, that is because my Kikaichu can distinguish from what is wrong in my body and make haste in purging my body from any foreign substance that enters me. Unfortunate for you, that the poison they secrete makes me completely immune from them but deadly for my enemy. Ukan tried to forcibly get out just as the insects were crawling all around him. Ukan writhed and screamed as Shino held out his hand and the insects from his body began covering Ukan everywhere. You have faced the wrong kind of enemy. At the same time, Konkuro planted all of his weapons towards the slots at the same time. Kiba and Konkuro could hear the screams of Sakan before it finally vanished as blood trickled out at the seams of Kurori. Elsewhere, Shikamaru breathed a sigh of relief as he sat down on his ass and looked up. Beside him was Tamari with her war fan in full display, the three purple stars shone towards Tuyuya. Boy, am I ever glad the Godime sent more backup, even if it is a troublesome woman from Suna. Tamari smirked. Just be glad your face hasn't been mangled yet, you snarky little bitch, or I would have to be the one who has to do it for her. Shikamaru's spine shivered up and down and thought, she's about as scary as mom is when she talks like this. Temari's smirk turned to a frown as she said to Shikamaru, since you're the commander of this team, I would like to give you a report of what we just discovered. Shikamaru's expression of relief turned to astonishment as he heard the words coming from Tamari when she swung her fan against their opponent. Your friend, Naruto, the one who defeated Gara back in the invasion, he's alive. Shikamaru looked flabbergasted at that and could only give out a flat out, what? You heard me, your blonde friend, the one that beat Gara. He wasn't really dead at all. Shikamaru looked at Tuyuya who was slowly rising up and about to play her flute once more when Tamari swung her fan upwards. Dai Kamedachi no Jutsu, Great Sickling Wines Technique. The winds howled and whistled and it created enough turbulence to disrupt Tuyuya's flute. I can give you details later, let's finish this fight for now. Tuyuya growled and shouted at them, pretty cocky for a shinobi from a fucking weak village. Tamari raised an eyebrow as she bit her right thumb and spread the blood on her fan. Lady, I don't like that tone of yours, you need to mind your fucking manners. Tamari then reeled her fan back as she swung it forward. Kuchios. Kiri Kiri my, summoning, blade dance. A white weasel carrying a scythe popped out of midair in a cloud of smoke before an entire forest area was ripped to shreds. Slash. Back with Kimamaro. That smirk, that putridly, annoying and confident smug, Sasuke couldn't believe it. Here he was trying to make sense of it all and the only thing that could escape from his mouth, was a dumbfounded question that Sasuke had never thought that would escape from his mouth, ever. Why you're alive? Naruto merely stood up and walked towards them, Lee who also had a dumbfounded look on his face, had free-flowing tears in his eyes as if he had seen a ghost. Of course I am, Sasuke. Being the reckless idiot is my job, Naruto emphasized this statement by pointing to himself. I don't expect you to plunge yourself into danger now that I'm back. This guy, Sasuke held back a smirk and then replied, if you had the gall to act like you were dead that just means you were caught off guard again. It's embarrassing to be called your rival. Naruto had a tick mark forming at the back of his head and gave a reply with a smirk of his own, ah, is that so? Well then it's not as embarrassing enough when you were about to lose it at the thought of me dying. Now it was Sasuke's turn to have a tick mark forming at the back of his head. You should have just stayed dead, Dobi. Cry more, Sasuke-chan. By this time, Kimamaro had appeared just beside Naruto to impale him directly through the chest. Naruto reacted just in time as he blasted Kimamaro with a gust of wind coming from one of his favorite techniques, Tenrin Providence Wheel, and a ball of fire courtesy of Sasuke. Kimamaro stumbled back but held his ground when Sasuke and Naruto shouted at the same time, stay out of this. Naruto then looked at the man that got up, bones protruding everywhere and the scales on his back right down to the tail made him look like an angry dinosaur armed to the teeth. We'd be having words later. Sasuke then channeled more chakra to his sword as it glowed and the crackled from the surge of electricity from Sasuke's chakra before he charged. Naruto then turned to Gara and said, I'm going in, Gara. Can you give us support from long range? Gara nodded as Lee was now beside him due to his sand, it shall be done. 
Naruto grinned. Good. With that, Naruto formed a clone and it formed a Rasengan just as Naruto activated Tenrin while also tapping into Kurama's chakra. Small debris rose up and a gust of wind picked up from his person. A red and vicious cloud of chakra enveloped him, formless but strong enough that it made Lee shudder just as the clone of Naruto completed the Rasengan. Fudin. Ura Tenrin Kazahana, Windmill Flower Reversal. Naruto shouted as the clone shoved the Rasengan to Naruto's right hand and absorbed the Rasengan into himself. I haven't had the chance to go all out for a while and I've been itching to vent my frustrations out for the last three months. Naruto then dashed, leaving in his wake dust clouds and shattered ground just as he went after Kimimaro. Sasuke reached first, with a near unmatched use of Shunshin, he had closed the gap in between him and Kimimaro in less than a second. Sasuke swung his sword sideways just as Kimimaro pulled out a bone sword from his shoulder and parrying away his blows while redirecting the flow of electricity to the ground. Since he can manipulate the strength and density of his bones, Kimimaro can manipulate the calcium stored in them and he used the stored calcium in them to ionize and attract the lightning from Sasuke's attack and planted a bone on the ground to redirect the flow of current. Sasuke looked surprised by this as Kimimaro retaliated with a knee to the gut. Sasuke dodged to the left as Kimimaro sailed a little above but Kimimaro was quick to adjust by swinging his humongous tail around about to smack Sasuke in the face. Naruto then arrived just in time, appearing from above as he descended on Kimimaro quickly just as Sasuke was forced down to the ground. The blonde had in his hands a pair of silver knives that gleamed in the sunlight and they glow with an effervescent blue. The chakra blades extended just as much as Sasuke's blade as Naruto swung at Kimimaro with an X pattern. The bone user ducked as Naruto as Naruto back flipped from Kimimaro's thrust and continued to descend to the ground. Naruto landed on his hands and quickly pushed himself off the ground and flipping back while performing a single hand seal with two cage bunshin popping into existence and charging at Kimimaro. Sasuke then reappeared behind him and with his sword held in reverse, swung the blade sideways to Kimimaro's neck. The Oto Shinobi tilted his head back narrowly being decapitated as two clones swung at him with their chakra blades. Kimimaro used his tail once more and smacked one of the clones out of existence with a mighty swing and then went straight for a thrust to the other clone that had missed him by quite a margin. Sasuke then saw a sudden shift in chakra from the shadow clone and noted it was high time to get the hell out of dodge as the clone's chakra grew more and more volatile. Boom. Sasuke disappeared just in time to see a cloud of smoke erupt from the force of the explosion as his feet skidded on the ground while planting his sword to maintain his footing. The Uchiha Saiyan then saw Kimimaro being tossed from the explosion covered in soot and quickly capitalized on it by performing several hand seals and began inhaling deeply. Kaden. Gukaku no Jutsu, Fire Release, Grand Fireball Skill. A large ball of flame escaped from Sasuke's mouth as rushed towards Kimimaro at high speed who had stumbled to the ground as a large fireball crashed and incinerated him quick. Not letting up, Sasuke lets loose another set of hand seals and began bombarding Kimimaro's general area. Kaden. Hausenka no Jutsu, Fire Release, Mythical Fire Flower Skill. A volley of flames came out from Sasuke's mouth and dropped on Kimimaro's general area. Sasuke kept pounding with the flames as the mark of the cursed seal slowly enveloped his skin everywhere. Kimimaro then came out of the flames, generally unscathed, the burns he had experienced were minor at best. His bone armor had taken most of the damage from Sasuke's attack. Naruto then ran beside Kimimaro who was aimed five fingers at him. It was then that sand had suddenly erupted and covered Naruto as five drilling bullets hit the sand on the mark. Naruto then slashed away at Kimimaro who countered with his own blade, thinking that his blade would repel the attack, Kimimaro reacted immediately when Naruto's wind-enhanced blade had cut through his bone sword like it was paper. Kimimaro jumped back, skidding to a stop as he aimed ten more bullets at the blonde who had began to dodge as trails of sand began protecting him and serving as a platform. Naruto weaved around the arcs of sand just as Kimimaro began peppering them with his finger bullets and Naruto quickly slid on the ground before he kicked Kimimaro back and performing a back flip just as Sasuke delivered a strong haymaker on Kimimaro's cheek staggering him back. Sasuke's hair now looked longer and the color was almost the same as Kimimaro's but much darker. A cross-shaped mark formed just on the bridge of his nose. Sasuke. What the hell? Naruto asked in confusion just before being slammed with a kick on the back and crashing on to the arcs of sand while Sasuke parried of a bone sword that could have pierced his shoulder. 
Sasuke reacted quickly with a spin and delivered a kick of his own but stopped when the bone protrusions had popped from the chest intending on his capture. Sasuke, instead of following through, decided to jump back just as Naruto let loose several jet streams of wind to Kimamaro while Sasuke followed it up with a barrage of flames from his own. Kimamaro was couldn't move as the vacuum of wind trapped him from the inside and Sasuke's fireballs engulfed him quick as the wind absorbed the flames and grew larger as a result. Kimamaro was set ablaze and grains of sand began gathering up around them. Gara then used his sand and gathered as much of it as possible as he sent a gigantic wave of its sand straight to Kimamaro. Ryu Sabakuryu, Sand Tsunami. The earth shook and vibrated from the gigantic wave of sand that was crashing down on Kimamaro. Naruto and Sasuke jumped back and with their chakra, Naruto rode on the wave of sand as Kimamaro was swept away from the attack while Sasuke let the cursed seal take over for him completely and grew a pair of grotesque wings and soared high enough to see the landscape give way to Gara's attack. A technique of pure destruction, this is the power of a Jinchuriki, Sasuke thought as Naruto flared his chakra and unleashed at least a hundred clones and descended upon Kimamaro like a swarm of bees. Sasuke watched as the thought of power prickled within his mind, he had never seen such an awesome display of strength that it could alter the entire landscape. He looked back at Naruto who had then began performing a series of hand seals as his clones began to destabilize their chakra once more and envelop the general area. Boom, 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 boom. This was the power of a Jinchuriki, almost near limitless amount of chakra, chakra for high-end destructive jutsu that can destroy anything in their paths. It was a macabre display of splendor that was as violent as it was majestic. No wonder the biju were considered forces of nature. He had just witnessed the grand display of power coming from two of them, two shinobi that were placed in a super soldier program that none of them wanted. Indeed, and finally he understood, that the price of power of was steep. The smoke cleared and they saw Kimamaro, mangled and injured but not out. He could still stand, therefore he could still fight. His left arm was now covered by a drill-like weapon made of his own bone, and it acted like a shield of sorts. The left cheek of Kimamaro's face was now nothing more than bone, any trace of muscle, skin or blood vessel was obliterated. His right arm had covers of bone around areas of destroyed skin. The boy ran straight at them and seemingly threw caution to the wind. Naruto reacted in kind, finally feeling the resolve that his enemy had shown. He could feel the desperation and the pain that Kimamaro was in yet he still continued to fight, this amount of dedication was in no way something that he could ignore and he responded in kind accepting Kimamaro's resolve and gave him that opportunity. He recharged Ura Tenren Kazahana, Providence Wheel Windmill Flower Reversal, and formed a Rasengan in hand, his chakra flared as did Kayubi's as he plunged straight to Kimamaro who thrusted his left arm at Naruto. Naruto let out a growl as Kurama's chakra and the wind created a vacuum-like phenomenon that sheared through all the bones that touched the blonde destroying them like they were nothing and allowing Naruto to thrust the Rasengan straight to Kimamaro's abdomen. Time seemed to slow down for Kimamaro, the pain was excruciating and he could feel the blonde's jutsu tearing his insides as he was forced back. He could feel himself falling away, descending as the power of the Rasengan pushed him down, his left hand outstretched, the effect of the cursed seal slowly receding. As this as far as I go. Sasuke. Kimamaro heard a shout and Sasuke appeared from above, his hand glowing with electricity now shining black. Sasuke descended on him like a dive bomber and as he inched closer and closer to Kimamaro, the bone user could feel his frustration and mortification of having lost against this group of children and one who sullied his master's grace. I can't die like this. I will not die, until I take you all with me. For Orochimaru-sama's sake. Sasuke's hand then pierced his chest as they landed on the ground. The hard ground gave way and cratered as Kimamaro mustered all of his killing intent and poured every ounce of his chakra to his bones and he growled just as he shouted the name of the technique. So where be no my, dance of the seedling ferns. The forest floor soon began growing bone spikes the size of trees and they began popping up violently from the earth. Sasuke, who had his hand shoved into Kimamaro's chest, retracted his arm violently and flew up just in time before he could be impaled just as Gara had Lee and Naruto on a platform of sand and floated above the sea of sharpened bones. A moment of silence escaped between the four of them as they watched the unmoving corpse of Kimamaro from below. You took him head on, Uzumaki Naruto, what possessed you to do such a reckless thing? Gara had asked, the blonde merely closed his eyes and said. His determination moved me. 
He answered as his jutsus powered down. He then continued as they landed on the edge of the forest. His resolve to fight to the bitter end reminded me so much of myself. He was willing to sacrifice everything just for that snake bastard Sake. Much like how any of us would be willing to die for the sake of those we care about. Naruto said this as he clenched his right hand into a fist. It was a victory, but it felt like a hollow one. Part of me wanted to save him, but I knew better than that. Someone like him would rather die for his master than to come with us. Haku's visage entered Naruto's mind as he began to walk away. So rather than making him come to us, I decided to accept his choice head on and complied with his challenge. He could have killed you, Sasuke remarked and Naruto smirked. I've done the impossible many times now, Sasuke. This wouldn't be the first. Naruto-kun, it pleases me so to see you alive and well. Your absence has affected us all. Your presence would be a most welcome return to Hinata-san as well. Lee said this as tears flowed from his eyes as Naruto laughed nervously. Care to tell me what happened during the three months that I was missing? Yes, I shall tell you everything there is to tell about. A voice had interrupted them with a cough, it really is you, huh, Naruto. Naruto turned to his left and saw Shikamaru and Tamari, just behind them, Kiba, Shino and Konkuro all were present with Kiba pointing at him like he was seeing a ghost. Shikamaru proceeded to punch Naruto in the face after that. A smile and a bit of a sniffle escaped Shikamaru. He couldn't help it, their friend turned out to be alive after all. You idiot, you had us all sad and worried. Naruto flinched and rubbed his face at that. He noted that Shikamaru's punch got harder during his absence. He could only smile and apologize. I could have made it to Konoha earlier, if it wasn't for being holed up in some place I didn't know about. I I it can't be. That idiot really is alive. Kiba shakily pointed a finger at the blonde, both glad and surprised to see his classmate seemingly back from the dead. Why do you doubt me still, Kiba? Is my word not enough for you to believe me? Shino asked and Kiba flinched. Much like how you tried to engage someone in taijutsu even if I knew you sucked then, I couldn't believe you for a second there without some proof. Konkuro gave an exasperated sigh and held the bridge of his nose, I vouched for your teammate, kid. Why did you keep denying it? How was I supposed to know that it wasn't some sick, elaborate prank to raise my morale? I was almost a goner back there. Kiba replied. Konkuro and Shino replied at the same time, we know. With Konkuro adding further, it's why we had to save your sorry ass as well as your dog. Next time, try to learn more useful jutsu and not just flashy ones. Kiba grew a tick mark at this, fuck off, doll boy. Konkuro was the one to grow an annoyance to the Inazuka this time. Should have just left your teammate to do the heavy lifting then, you ungrateful mutt. Can it, both of you slobs. We have better things to do and discuss while we head back to Konoha. Tamari scolded the two, glaring daggers at them that Konkuro shivered. Kiba was about to reply with some snarky insult when a hand was placed on his mouth courtesy of the puppet user fully aware of the boy's intentions. Trust me, you do not want to do that. Shikamaru had looked to Tamari as he asked the girl, by the way, have you by any chance encountered any of our teammates along the way? Tamari, Gara and Konkuro all nodded and it was Tamari who spoke, we met up with the one with the pink hair. She was carrying that chubby kid that looked like he turned to a weight loss program. He seemed pretty messed up but that girl has been trying to make her stable as she made her way back to Konoha. The Hokage decided to send some medic teams last time we heard, so your friend wouldn't be in too much of a problem, I think. Shikamaru cursed, from the description that Tamari was telling him, Choji had taken the red pill. He then asked the girl once more, what about Neji and Tenten? Ah, that Hyuga and the one I beat the crap out of in the Chunin exam. Yeah, we met up with them too. They seemed tired and a bit bloody. But otherwise, they're all alive. At the mention of Sakura's name, Naruto and Sasuke looked at each other with the blonde mumbling to his teammate, oh, she's going to be so mad. Why are you looking at me? Sasuke asked and Naruto quickly replied, don't look at me. I'm not the one who had this harebrained idea of learning about the cursed seal and went to embrace the danger all on my own. At the thought of seeing Sakura and possibly punching the ever-living daylights out of Sasuke, Naruto had to chuckle inwardly. Inside him however, Asura looked at Sasuke intently. Is he awakening as well? Three days later, they had all returned to Konoha, 
a little roughed up but otherwise well enough on their own. At the front of the gates stood Sakura, a scowl on her face as she saw Sasuke. She approached the boy very sternly and slapped him on the cheek to get her point across but not before scolding Sasuke about his recklessness. Naruto gave a smile, he looked at the two and felt the genuine concern coming from Sakura. The pink-haired girl turned to him and she stood shocked, her voice trembled, as if there was something caught in her throat. N Naruto. Naruto merely gave a sheepish grin while scratching the back of his head. Sakura was about to bonk him on the head, until she had heard a familiar voice sounding at the background. N Naruto-kun. Naruto turned to that voice and there Hinata stood, who was anxiously waiting for her teammates. She had grown her hair slightly, Naruto noticed and it was longer than the last time he had seen them. Her lavender eyes were shaking as she looked at him and Naruto slowly tore off the bandages from his face, ripping them out one by one. Everyone else watched, mildly amused and intrigued as the interaction between them began to unfold. Hanada watched wide-eyed, as the boy with a messy mop of blonde hair slowly tore off the bandages that were wrapping around his face. Her heart was racing fast and strong as the boy before her slowly revealed his face marred by the wrapped white cloth as the wind gently swayed her slowly growing shoulder-length hair as did the tips of the boy's bandages gently flapping to the wind. When he finally ripped it open, his face revealed and his bright blue eyes turned cheery and joyous, he gave his ever trademark grin that Hanada had missed the most. He was her son, shining brightly in a midsummer afternoon, burning with passion and cutting her darkness in half, illuminating her colorless world. His hair had grown longer, the bangs at the side of his face now were longer and reached just below the sides of his jaws, he lost a little weight and his cheeks deflated a little. But those whisker marks were still there, that same grin, those same deep passionate blue eyes. Then, his voice had brought her back to the world as he said to her, I'm sorry, I made you worry. Hanada couldn't help but slowly approach the boy in front of her right hand on her mouth as she desperately tried but failed to withhold her tears threatening to fall from her eyes. When she was finally at arm's reach, she held out both her hands to his cheeks as she stuttered between her sobs, still disbelieving and hoping against all odds, that she wasn't dreaming or that this wasn't just a cruel joke. T this isn't a dream. Naruto, who merely gave a sincere and true smile at her as he held her hands, replied, no, it isn't. It can't be a dream when I'm really standing here, in front of you. Then, as her will failed her, she let her pent-up emotions fall from her face, all her grief, anger and hate, just disappeared as she embraced him with all of her being, all of her sensations and all of her emotions. Why you're really here, with me? Her tears were a mix of joy and relief. Her cries to him only made him more aware of her feelings for him. His large smile shrank to one of understanding as he looked to his shoulder with her head resting on it and let her tears come forth. Thus, he reciprocated her embrace. He wrapped his arms around her small waist. He could feel her trembling and he had realized that he never wanted this girl in his arms to make her sad ever again. I'm finally home, Hanada. And her cries would only grow louder. Chapter 17. Epilogue Book 1. Epilogue. Book 1. A Journey of a Single Step. Hanada watched wide-eyed, as the boy with a messy mop of blonde hair slowly tore off the bandages that were wrapping around his face. Her heart was racing fast and strong as the boy before her slowly revealed his face marred by the wrapped white cloth as the wind gently swayed her slowly growing shoulder-length hair as did the tips of the boy's bandages gently flapping to the wind. When he finally ripped it open, his face revealed and his bright blue eyes turned cheery and joyous, he gave his ever trademark grin that Hanada had missed the most. He was her son, shining brightly in a midsummer afternoon, burning with passion and cutting her darkness in half, illuminating her colorless world. His hair had grown longer, the bangs at the side of his face now were longer and reached just below the sides of his jaws, he lost a little weight and his cheeks deflated a little. But those whisker marks were still there, that same grin, those same deep passionate blue eyes. Then, his voice had brought her back to the world as he said to her, I'm sorry, I made you worry. Hanada couldn't help but slowly approach the boy in front of her, right hand on her mouth as she desperately tried but failed to withhold her tears threatening to fall from her eyes. When she was finally at arm's reach, she held out both her hands to his cheeks as she stuttered between her sobs, still disbelieving and hoping against all odds, that she wasn't dreaming or that this wasn't just a cruel joke. T this isn't a dream. Naruto, who merely gave a sincere and true smile at her as he held her hands, replied, 
No, it isn't. I'm real, right in front of you. Then, as her will failed her, she let her pent-up emotions fall from her face. All her grief, anger and hate, just disappeared as she embraced him with all of her being, all of her sensations and all of her emotions. Why you're really here, with me? Her tears were a mix of joy and relief. Her cries to him only made him more aware of her feelings for him. His large smile shrank to one of understanding as he looked to his shoulder with her head resting on it and let her tears come forth. Thus, he reciprocated her embrace. He wrapped his arms around her small waist. He could feel her trembling and he had realized that he never wanted this girl in his arms to make her sad ever again. I'm finally home, Hanada. And her cries would only grow louder. After Hanada calmed down in his arms, Naruto couldn't help but feel completely overwhelmed after what had happened with the last two months. He was more overwhelmed by the fact the girl currently in his arms didn't seem to let go in the slightest and that the rest of his peers were all watching the two of them with eyes that he could tell from the girls were the same as that when girls see couples walking around the park and they were practically smiling at him as he finally let Hanada go while she reluctantly did so as well. Of course, being a boy who had pretty much little to no understanding of social graces, he grew somewhat embarrassed and blushed when everything had finally settled down. Hanada had finally been aware of her surroundings as well, blushing heavily and all the while clinging to his right arm as she held it close to her. Naruto couldn't exactly place where his emotions currently lie, but he did feel a little funny and confused when he could feel his arms being close to the girl's bosom, baggy clothes or the fabric of their attire themselves be damned. Wow, those are soft. Naruto hadn't noticed it, but his cheeks were now growing a rosy blush that was somewhat noticeable. Then an Anbu with a tiger mask dropped down to his front just as Ino, Sakura and Tenten decided to tease him and Hinata and said with a flat voice, Uzumaki-san, the Hokage requests that you come to the office immediately concerning your status and action these past few days. Naruto gave a nod as the tiger-masked Anbu put up a single hand seal but not before saying, it is good to have you back, Uzumaki-san. Naruto gave a sigh as he turned to Hinata and asked the girl, Hey, Hinata, I have to talk to the Hokage, can we meet up later? Hinata shook her head at this, No, please, let me be by your side a little longer. My experience for the last two months was me believing that you had died, now that it wasn't true, I don't want to leave you for long. I, I, I would lose my mind if I were to lose you again. Naruto sported a new blush as he was caught off guard by Hinata's answer. Two months was a long enough time to have changed a lot of things. Naruto finally gave up on dissuading Hinata to let her stay when she gave her a pleading and sad look that he couldn't say no to. The boy merely walked towards the Hokage Tower with Hinata holding on to him like he would disappear again. I can't blame her, I was supposedly dead. When he walked around the streets of his village, those of the elderly would look at him as if they had seen a ghost and trembled in either fear or disbelief. Naruto looked at them weirdly and they would simply turn around and decide to give an excuse to go do something else. The blonde scratched the back of his head as he made his way towards the tower. When Shizune saw him, the woman had her stacks of paper fall from her hands and scattered to the floor as Naruto greeted her with a smile. When he finally made way towards the entrance of the office, Naruto turned towards Hinata and said, can you stay here, Hanada? I don't think it would be a good idea for you to be inside, Tsunade Ba-chan can sometimes have a temper that could kill anyone. The girl looked reluctant for a second but finally decided to let go and look down, Naruto smiled at her and reassured her, don't worry, I'll only be there for a few minutes. When Hanada had finally let go, Naruto felt like he would have wanted it to last longer, but seeing as he had something to do, he gave a deep breath and opened the doors to the Hokage's office. There, he saw Tsunade reading some papers as she looked up and saw Naruto looking at her with a sheepish grin. Tsunade then stared blankly at the blonde and then gave a flat tone in her voice, you. Naruto was nervously scratching the back of his head at this, you've got brass balls to have disobeyed your commanding officers, brat. You're lucky you're technically filed under the Mia category and you weren't on the active duty list. If it were anything else, I would have bashed your head in for such a stupid mistake and would have stripped you of your rank. But since you have a loophole technicality, I will let this slide but only just this once. Tsunade replied with a glare that sent Naruto's spine shivering. He wouldn't want to be another victim from Tsunade's monstrous fist. But he gave a sigh of relief anyway when Tsunade had decided to let it go out of a technicality. That doesn't mean you're off the hook, mister. 
Naruto sweated bullets yet again. Tsunade smirked seeing her subordinate blonde squirm in her hands. May I remind you that Kakashi just sent a full report about what you said that you were willing to face the consequences. Tsunade asked with a grin and Naruto stuttered at that as he tried avoiding eye contact with the Hokage who was giving an amused smirk. I I did say that, didn't I? S so what would you have me do? Tsunade couldn't help it anymore and she gave a very unladylike snort and laughed out as she looked up with her right hand covering her eyes. Ha 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 ha. You look like you're a constipated jackass right now, brat. She said as she tried to control her laughter, barely succeeding. But in all seriousness, you're going to have to clean the academy toilets for two weeks because of your insubordination, though technically, you shouldn't. I just felt doing this because you should know that you can't do anything that you want. That'd be your lesson in not following your superiors ever again, brat. Naruto groaned as he looked down. It was like he had two weeks worth of detention all over again. Naruto could only curse. Fuck me, this sucks. Tsunade then finally looked serious and said to the blonde, I want to ask you about what happened during that two months you were gone brat, you were imprisoned and held against your will. Do you know who did it? Naruto shook his head, no, I don't know who did it. All I know is that guy is an asshole and kept insulting me over his crappy sound system. I didn't even see that bastard's face. His mooks are the same though, they wore masks but not like the Anbu. They were faceless and uniform in style, there's nothing to see in them other than a couple of eye holes. Tsunade hummed at the blonde's words and thought about the boy's experience. She had hoped that at least Danzo would have slipped and would have a confirmation coming from Naruto. Apparently, Danzo thought that his plan had a chance for failure so he went ahead and made sure to cover all holes in his plans. That also unfortunately, involved the blonde obliterating the base to kingdom come. Now there was no way to piece Naruto's abduction to Danzo's machinations. He plays too good. I need something else. Tsunade was in deep thought when Naruto called out her name. Ba-chan, can I go now? Hanada's waiting outside and I feel like I should assure her that everything's okay now. Tsunade shook her head with a knowing smile plastered on her face, brat, someone like her. You should let her do as she pleases for a few days. Right now what she needs isn't your reassurance, but your presence. You were claimed dead, brat. She saw you with her own two eyes. Do you think someone like her would just be assured with an okay coming from you? Naruto remained silent as Tsunade stood up and went around the boy before gently putting a hand on the boy's head. Someone like you still has much to learn concerning women, but let me remind you this. Tsunade kneeled down in front of him with a smile on her face as her chin rested on her right hand, be there for her. Until she realizes herself that she doesn't have to be near you all the time. And I'm glad that you're still with us. Naruto looked down and gave a silent nod as Tsunade then placed both of her hands on his shoulders, now go, I understand that there are things you still want to talk about but you don't know how. I just want you to know that we're all here to support you, even though there were secrets that were kept from you. But you should know how Jiraiya and Serutobi sensei cared for you. Naruto turned his back and replied, I already know that and I understand why they had to keep secrets or why Ero Senen would choose duty above me. He wanted me to have a safe home even though it wasn't much but if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be Chunin, and I wouldn't be able to beat Gara. I would be illiterate if it wasn't for the old man who taught me how to read and write. There were things that were done for me even though they weren't much, but they meant something. Naruto grabbed the knob of the office door as Tsunade let the boy finish, it means that we all have to endure. Ero Senen endured the weight of his conscience and chose the safety of his home above just my own. He knew that he still had comrades here, comrades and ideals that he's willing to die for. The same with the old man, he had to bear the weight of ruling the village above his own feelings. He had to do what's right for all or most of the people. There were things that he had to do out of his love for the village something that I'm now fully aware of. Naruto then closed his eyes as he tried to quell his own emotions. But it still hurts to be treated like this. I can take on the hatred of the villagers, to be treated like dirt and be looked down. What I can't take easily is betrayal of my trust. I can understand why they had to do it and it frustrates me that I can't be angry at them even though this happened. For the life of me, I just can't do it. But if there was one thing I could take away from my stay in that shithole, it's that I finally know who my parents were. I'm happy just knowing that they existed and that they didn't abandon me. 
Tsunade wordlessly turned to her desk as Naruto turned the knob and pulled the door as he was about to walk out. Brat, you really have grown. Your parents would be proud. Naruto merely nodded as he got out, Hinata stood outside the door anxiously waiting for him. Naruto remained silent as Hinata looked on in worry. He was about to smile at her when Hinata asked, Is there something wrong, Naruto-kun? Naruto merely closed his eyes for a moment before he shook his head with a smile, Nothing, Hinata. Just that I have some punishments I need to do. Hinata tilted her head slightly at this and asked, Why? Naruto merely gave a nervous chuckle as he scratched the back of his neck, a telltale sign of his embarrassment. Well I went against Kakashi Sensei's orders that I be sent back to Konoha immediately while the whole fiasco with Sasuke and Odo was going on. Tsunade Ba-chan didn't like that one bit and now I have to serve some form of community service for two weeks. Hanada didn't look convinced by that one bit but never insisted on what she thought. In due time, Naruto would tell but right now, she would believe him. She went for his hand with hers and grabbed them gently. I stand by my words that I too would endure what you are enduring, Naruto-kun. So whatever happened during your time back then, I wish to share your pain and your sorrow. If I were to be your pillar of strength then I will be that person. Whatever it is that pains you so, know that I trust you, completely, fully and always so should you do the same with me. I will try my best to soothe you from your pain. Three times, Naruto blushed that day and it wouldn't be the last. He grinned at her and said, Thank you, Hanada. I I don't think you know how much your words mean to me right now. Thanks for being here. Hanada gave him a smile that would melt his heart even further. Let's get you reacquainted then. I'm sure Aruka sensei would be happy to see you back. Naruto gave her a smile and liked that particular idea. It had been a while since he saw his teacher. News of his apparent death would have not sit well with Aruka for that matter. He needed to check out his former sensei and see how he was holding up. When they began to walk, Naruto had noticed that people were staring at him again like they had seen a ghost. Others would fall speechless when he was within sight, especially the elder population. Naruto would have chalked it up to his current likeness with the Yandaimi. After learning the fact that he indeed was the son of the Yandaimi Hokage, Naruto had gained a somewhat different perspective on his own village. It had been lingering on his mind since the time he had been imprisoned. There's something missing here, Naruto thought, the fact that the night of the Kayubi's rampage still present on his mind made him frown a little. What caused the Kayubi to go wild and what got it to escape from his mother? His thoughts were cut off when he had seen Aruka seeing off the children from the academy. Naruto grinned and called out to his sensei, Aruka sensei. Aruka stopped for a moment and looked at the source of the voice. In front of him stood Naruto, wide grin and all and he waved at him with Hinata just behind the blonde. Aruka did a double take and cleared his eyes for a second before he uttered the words he had never thought would escape him ever again, Naruto. Naruto gave a grin and replied as normal and laid back as possible, yep. I went through hell just to get back here. Aruka went closer to the boy and silence reigned between them before Aruka conked Naruto at the forehead as a sliver of a tear escaped from his left eye. Naruto winced. You idiot. I never realized how much of an idiot I was for having grown so attached to you. Aruka kneeled down and hugged the boy as he said, we all thought we lost you. Naruto somewhat maintained his grin as Aruka held on for a few seconds and looked back to Hinata and asked her, since when? Hinata answered, a a little earlier in the day, Aruka sensei. Naruto-kun came back with the rest after their mission against Odo. Aruka grinned having his bigger return after three months of depression and regrets, I see, so he managed to link up with the backup team sent by Hokage-sama. Hanada nodded. Aruka seemed impressed. All right, since you're here, why don't we celebrate? I'm sure Tyuki and Ayame would love to see you. To this, Aruka turned to Hanada and asked her, would you like to come with us, Hanada? I'm sure the others would be delighted to meet you as well. Hanada affirmed with a single nod and a small smile. When they finally arrived in Ichiraku, Naruto was met with disbelief and Tyuki throwing hysterics out believing they were being visited by the ghost of Naruto asking for one last bowl of ramen before passing on. When all of that clout was cleared though, the ramen chef and his daughter turned back into prodding and teasing mode as they embarrassed the hell out of Naruto in front of Hinata and told a lot of jokes that made Naruto and Hinata blush. Seeing the shop liven up like that, Aruka couldn't help think that Naruto's presence made everyone happier. 
I'm telling you, this has got be some kind of miraculous sign. Nobody can just up and tell you straight to your face that someone had a brush with death and lived to tell the tale about it. Chuki mused, making a yame hitting his shoulder slightly with a scowl. It's rude to talk about stuff like that especially when we have a special guest here. Ayame pointed to Hanada who looked like she was about to melt in her chair out of embarrassment. Chuki seemed to laugh it off. Ah, my bad. Wouldn't want to upset Naruto's special guest here. Still, it's amazing that you made it back in one piece. Chalk it up with Lady Luck or the gods smiling at you. Naruto scratched the back of his head with a nervous laugh. I got out mostly in one piece but not exactly what I would have imagined. Naruto ni chan. Naruto turned around at the call of his name, and then in there stood a panting Konohamaru, followed by Moegi and Udon who were panting themselves out in fatigue. It is true, you are alive. Konohamaru said a grin forming in his face as a small tear escaped from him. Uruka turned to look at the grandson of the Sandame Hokage and raised an eyebrow, Konohamaru. Where have you been? You haven't gone to school for more than a week. I, Konohamaru interrupted the teacher before he answered with his fists shaking as his facial expression hardened into a frown. I was training. I was doing everything I can to try and catch up with Naruto Nichan. I wanted to get stronger immediately. I wanted to find Grandpa's killer and avenge him and then go after Naruto Nichan's killer. The moment I realized that I couldn't do anything was the moment that made me think that before I could become Hokage, I needed to do more. It was then that Naruto understood. Naruto saw something in Konohamaru that he had seen almost every single day when he was younger. He stood from his seat and stood in front of the younger boy as Udon and Moegi uttered their leader's name. Naruto saw within Konohamaru, a desperate boy. A boy who was slowly losing his innocence against the harsh cruelties of the world, he saw those hardened and embattled eyes of despair. He did not only see himself in the boy, he also saw Sasuke, he saw Neji, he saw Haku, and he saw Gara. He saw many more people, all falling into that pit of despair and helplessness. The moment one feels that they couldn't do anything, the moment that they fall within their own weakness and washed away by a concept that they understood as fate. What he saw within Konohamaru was pain. The pain of loss and the pain of despair. In a shinobi village, the concept of death was introduced at a young age. It was a form of realism that many children needed to understand with many falling within the ranks of the shinobi system early on. But it could never prepare them for the real thing. Nothing could, unless you were part of the history of the bloody mist. Konohamaru, don't do anything reckless. Naruto then rested his right hand over the honorable grandson's head. No matter how tempting it gets, don't ever fall for traps when chasing after your goal, Konohamaru. There will be times where you would feel to just let go, but don't. Naruto recalled his time within the confines of that hellish prison and his choice to get out. When I was away, I realized that being strong is the power to embrace your ideals no matter how tempting it is to let go. The power to accept truths without stumbling, the power to never bend to people that will harm you. And the power to give everything you have for the people that you care about. Konohamaru looked up at his brother figure as Naruto gave him a smile. In the end, if you can endure the pain, if you can overcome it and become something better, then becoming Hokage wouldn't be just a dream it would be a reality. Konohamaru's grin slowly returned as the people inside the small restaurant smiled along. Naruto may have returned differently, but his connection to others will never change as well as his understanding of suffering and his own way to support people. Uruka smiled as he saw his favorite student grin after Konohamaru and returned to his seat besides Hinata. Naruto, your growth as a shinobi is different from other people. The stronger you get, the more you become attached and familiar to people, familiar to their pain. This is your greatest strength, the ability to sway people to your side because of that pain, to your own simplistic but strong views. Uruka then turned to Hinata who was now smiling, to turn pain into virtue and use it to drive your way upwards, to make people see and overcome their own weaknesses, those are strengths that separate leaders from mere men. Uruka smiled as he began their conversation once more, scolding Konohamaru and laughing along with the people inside this small restaurant. This kind of joy, I hope you can continue sharing this, Naruto. Hokage's office. Nara Shikaku stood before Tsunade, flanking him from behind were the heads of the interrogation and intelligence divisions, Morino Ibiki and Yamanaka Inoichi. 
Tsunade had her elbows resting on her desk as her hands were linked together and obscuring the lower part of her face. Shikaku didn't like this one bit. He had seen grim faces plastered on the faces of a cage before, it usually involved something dangerous or more likely a move that could potentially prove fatal to a cage's own ruling. You've called for us, Godime sama Morino Ibiki asked as Tsunade nodded. I've called you three because I wanted your personal opinion on a thorn on my side for quite a while. Shikaku inwardly sighed, this would be something meant for the black ops if the seriousness of Tsunade's tone were an indication. You three are part of the most brilliant minds within the village and you three are the neural network that makes the village spick and span. What would you think about a proposal in taking down Root? All three men visibly flinched. Especially Inoichi, he had known one of the members of his clan was part of the said group. Has Danzo done something that would jeopardize the safety of everyone in the village? Shikaku asked. He looked Inoichi who was looking back at him, somewhat nervous and in a cold sweat. Not necessarily so, but I'm suspecting his involvement of trying to cause a stir in opposition against me. I also suspect he has been doing the same during Serutobi Sensei's rule, particularly after the Kayubi incident 13 years ago. Morino Ibiki replied, Hokage-sama, Sandame-sama has been keeping Danzo on a tight leash ever since he came out of retirement and even before that. Although the existence of Root remains relatively uncommon to many within the village, Danzo-sama has remained active in his covert operations. He has very brutal methods but I would not deny that what he is doing is an effective method in maintaining village security. To stage a coup out of nowhere would go against his very intentions of keeping us safe. Inoichi then spoke up. What is the incident that made you consider this, Hokage-sama? Tsunade then handed them three folders. Inside, there contained Kakashi and Jiraiya's mission reports during the past three months as well as an autopsy report. It involved a lot of searching, turning stones and scouring the entire country all in the search for an apparently not so dead after all Jinchuriki. Three months ago, I received word of Uzumaki Naruto's apparent death. The body that was turned up at the morgue was nothing more than a fake, probably a deceased operative modified with Naruto's likeness by a jutsu. The autopsy report and the DNA records proved that it wasn't Naruto. This mission that I had given Kakashi and Jiraiya was off the records. No one was supposed to know them apart from the three of us. I had suspected that this would be part of Donzo's handiwork or at least his subordinates. But root members have no registered records within the village so I had to resort to look for shinobi records that were marked as Mia. I'm sure you all know by now that Naruto turned up at the gates a few hours ago and his statement during his capture was typical of Donzo's handiwork. Serutobi Sensei's journal statements concerning the man were that he had been after Naruto for years and it was political will that kept him away from Donzo's grasp. Inoichi frowned at that, so Danzo was trying to indoctrinate the Jinchuriki to his side. What could a man like Danzo hope to gain from gaining such a wild card? He had no methods as to how he could control a force of nature like the Kyubi. Unfortunately, Naruto couldn't give me any more specifics or at least a confirmed image of the man, he kept talking to the boy through speakers and he would be forced to overcome tasks while having his chakra sealed. That indeed would be a typical textbook work by Danzo. Shikaku noted as he raised an eyebrow while looking at the reports. Ibiki voiced his opinion on the matter as the question that gnawed at the mind of these three men. It is rather confusing as to why would Danzo try and recruit the Jinchuriki to his side. He has no particular method to control a biju of that we know of. Unless he has learned that Naruto is somehow able to fully control the Kyubi at this point in time. The three men had a cold bead of sweat falling from their brow at thinking of such a possibility falling within Danzo's hands. There are signs here and there and according to the reports given by Jiraiya and Kakashi, I would say that Naruto has been learning to control the Kyubi to a degree. He managed to level an entire facility to the ground and destroyed any evidence that could authorize a full dismantling of Root, politically and physically. So you are proposing for a strike team to take down Root, Hokage-sama? Inoichi asked and Tsunade gave a serious nod as she stood up from her chair and turned to look outside. That would be saying it lightly. Danzo has been pulling strings far enough. He is aware that I am on to him and the same that he is to me. We don't know what type of damage he has done within and outside our borders and the less I know the more it is making me feel uncomfortable of the fact. Shikaku raised his hand at this, I would advise to refrain from doing such a tactic for now, Hokage-sama. 
Tsunade turned around to Shikaku as the man said, if for purely political reasons, this would be suicide on your part. You will be putting the rest of the village in an uneasy state. Although we are a military-run village, there are still politics involving this matter. Danzo is still part of the village system and his sizable force is nothing to sneeze at either. Shikaku then stood up and explained his reasoning to the Hokage who raised an eyebrow. Let's give a hypothetical example. Even though the Uchiha were held in suspicion with the Kayubi's rampage 13 years ago, they were vital to the village. Imagine the fallout within the village if the people discovered that the leaders authorized the genocide of that clan. The common rank and file shinobi would be heavily demoralized with the thought of disagreeing with you would result in death because people will spin it to their own tails even if the Uchiha clan was in suspicion. The civil war in Kiri happened that way. The Mizukage ordered the deaths of clans that had Keke Genke for reasons unknown, but if it involved civil disobedience, and the Mizukage wanted stability then we are merely accelerating our own downfall, it is best to move when we have the right information that we can very well disseminate to everyone within our forces. They say that fighting with a greater moral ground would bring about a better result and I don't necessarily disagree to such a notion. It is a better alternative than to put our forces on a constant watch and distrust within our own system. It would do us nothing good. Ibiki leaned back to his chair and closed the folder within his hands in order to read it later at his department. I agree with Shikaku on this matter, Hokage-sama. The threat wouldn't be within Donzo's ranks but the fallout of such a move. Inoichi looked down and closed his eyes at this as he thought deeply, I understand your problem Hokage-sama. I imagine Shibi-san would probably feel the same about this situation given that some of us have members who went to root for inexplicable reasons. But let us withhold hasty decisions for now, until then, we'll do our best for obtaining information en route. As much as I see the efficacy of Donzo's methods, I would rather not have a polarizing ideology split our forces apart. Shikaku's proposal is our best option. Tsunade turned to them and nodded, very well, we'll reconvene with this problem on some other unspecified time. I don't want that sneaky little bastard getting the wrong idea and starting his own regime within the village. One week later, mere days since the return of the backup team with Naruto in tow, the said blonde was back in training with his wind element and fighting within close quarters with Hinata after Naruto's grueling chore of cleaning the academy toilets all day. The blonde could swear that he remembered the toilets during his stay in school were much cleaner than they now were. The menial labor and the lack of missions really drove him to the wall and would vent his anger with his elemental training. By now, he had learned to stabilize his wind blades with his knives. They no longer look like shimmering waves on the beach but much more defined with clear edges. When it came to training with Hinata though, Naruto found out that Hinata had gotten better with taijutsu. Her footwork was much more solid and she can strike with much more decisive action and pinpoint accuracy. Hanada had told him of just how she had focused on training and how her anger within her seemed to fuel her and drive her to a very focused point. Though it was different this time, in that Hanada's application of her family's style were much less vicious and more controlled. Naruto noted that Hanada had mellowed down when he returned which she confessed was part of the reason. He had also found out that Tsunade had assigned Hinata to be Naruto's guard, in order to make sure he did his punishment well enough. Naruto didn't know if he should insult the Hokage or thank her for that. He visited the hospital quite often especially Choji, Neji and Tenten, who looked at him shocked on his first visit. But they recovered enough to welcome him back. It was also in these days that Naruto finally revealed to Hinata much of what he had learned during his captivity. Naruto picked up Kakashi's hobby of spending time with the memorial, looking at the engraved names of his father and his mother. He had not known where his parents were buried in the large cemetery. The people that knew them were not within the village or that he didn't know who were close to his parents enough to point him to their graves. Kakashi still wasn't back on his mission and Jiraiya wasn't due to come back for another few days. When Hinata had found out Naruto's lineage, she insisted that she comes with him in order to pay her respects. The blonde noted that even though Hinata seemed shy and withdrawn, she still had that nobility within her to pay tribute to great people who died with honor. He had slowly realized that he was growing closer and closer to the girl beside him and she had grown used to his presence. The first few days were very emotional for her but in time, the normalcy went back. Naruto assured her and boosted her confidence and she kept being a pillar of support for him when no one else could. Before he had realized it, 
He had taken Hanat out on a simple date, a conversation in one of the training grounds and a bag of treats to eat. It was simple and it was an experience that he could remember well, what with a recovered Neji keeping watch at a fair distance was any indication. He had then met Hanabi, Hanada's younger sister. Naruto's assessment of the younger Hayuga was that she was much more outgoing than her older sister. He liked that Hanabi idolized and was protective of her older sister. She was so caring of her that Naruto found it cute as well as endearing to Hanada more on how much she truly cared for her sister. In one instance, he had suddenly blurted out to Hanada, your sister is really adorable, you know. I like the way of how much she throws so much care for you. It must mean you're a pretty good sister to her too. Hanada smiled well enough at that time and she replied that she indeed loved and adored Hanabi just as much making Naruto grin. Of course, that was not without its problems though, when Hanabi and Konohamaru met for the first time, it was the exact opposite of Naruto and Hanada's interactions. They would squabble a lot like, well, children and they would argue on who had a better role model. Both of them were still in the, boys are icky, and, girls have cooties stage after all. Naruto and Hinata would simply just break up their little feud and decide to meet after catering to the needs of the children that idolized them. But they would have fun shortly after. As Naruto and Hinata's relationship blossomed, his connection to his team was changing too, but not necessarily in a positive way. Or at least, it's what Naruto was thinking. Whenever the three of them would meet up for simple training, Sakura would tend to ignore Sasuke and go directly to Naruto for any inquiries. As if pigs weren't already flying, Naruto was absolutely confused as to why it was Sakura who was now giving Sasuke the cold shoulder. That made no sense to him. When pried about her attitude, Sakura merely changed the subject all the while looking upset. Sasuke kept looking with as much as confusion as him and instead chalked it up to Sakura being a girl and she was in the midst of her, girl thing. It's not like Sasuke was upset or anything but he was terribly confused as to why he was the one being treated like some nuisance within the team. It got so bad that when Sasuke tried to talk to Sakura, she gave him the glare. Sakura was giving Sasuke problems. Well, stranger stuff has happened, Naruto thought and scratched the back of his head, now that he was facing the monument of fallen heroes once more. He had decided to pay another visit. He felt like 12 years of not knowing his parents were 12 years of finally getting closure about them. Doubt was now out of his head, his parents died fighting the Kyubi, they didn't abandon him out of some maligned form of hatred towards the Kyubi. And for that, a small piece of reassurance was placed on his shoulders. If for some reason that he found that his doubts were true, he wasn't sure how far gone he would have been. His contemplation was broken when he looked to his side, there stood Sasuke now wearing the black sleeveless turtleneck shirt given to Anbu members, to his right bicep was tattooed the mark of the organization. His sword firmly strapped to his back. His mask was off, he was about to be inducted to the next level of training from what he had told them. It's not like you to spend your time here mourning for the dead, Sasuke. Sasuke shrugged, I always mourn for the dead, Dobi. I always pay my respects to my fallen clan members. Those that died in either during a mission or the massacre, I always mourn for them. It's just that this isn't normally the place that I would be doing it. Kakashi just made me go here every time after I trained to offer some silent prayers. Naruto then looked back to the stone memorial and looked at the names that were etched in there that Naruto knew were very significant to him. Uzumaki Kashina, Namikaze Minato, you're the one who doesn't seem to take solemnity in mourning for the dead, though. Sasuke threw the argument back at him but Naruto didn't even retaliate. Normally, I would be trying my hardest to live my life and not think about the people that died until this very day. I didn't want any of those depressing thoughts. But ever since I got back, I realized that sometimes, that there are answers that we can't live without. Sasuke was now beside him also looking at the names that were etched. He looked at the names of fallen members of the Uchiha clan and nodded his head. When I was locked up, I got to know who my parents were. Naruto trailed off as he crouched down and he touched the name of his mother and then his father. In a way, I felt relieved but at the same time, questions just keep popping up in my head over, and over, and over again. Naruto held his face with his left hand as he continued. Like what would have happened if one of my doubts came true, like my father or mother left me because of the Kyubi. Why did they have to die? Why did it have to happen? Why was it me that was chosen? 
Naruto then stood up and then put his hands in his pockets, I could never imagine what would happen if I had been the one to have found out that I was abandoned. I wouldn't know what to do. Maybe it'd be me that would have gone to the deep end. Naruto then looked at Sasuke straight with resolve in them, promise me, Sasuke, if I ever sink and can't come back, I want you to promise me that you would put me down. Sasuke decided to change the subject, the conversation between them brought forth memories of Itachi and his final word to him before he had mentally tortured him. Who are you parents? Naruto smiled as he closed his eyes and looked back at the memorial stone. Let's just keep it a secret for now. I don't want you to change your perception of me just because of my parents. I'd like to keep that knowledge to myself for now. Naruto turned back and then looked at Sasuke, promise me that you'll do it. Sasuke scowled, I can't promise you anything. Sasuke then kneeled right in front of the memorial and ran his hands to every familiar name that was etched on the stone's surface. Falling into darkness isn't something meant for you, idiot. You're going to be more than that. Sasuke then looked up. The view of the full moon made him stare at it for a few seconds before adding, besides, a Hokage wishing for his death by his subordinate if he ever loses his mind is a Hokage with no confidence in himself. I wouldn't be following such a weak person. Naruto grinned. Well it was worth a shot. I want to ask though, what's with Sakura? Sasuke shrugged. Hell if I know, I don't understand women all too well. Naruto sighed. You can be an insensitive prick sometimes, Sasuke, well, most of the time, really. But maybe you shouldn't stop trying to talk to her about it. That's ironic, coming from the idiot that couldn't recognize Hinata's affections for the majority of our stay in the academy. Naruto scowled at that, whatever, bastard, I'm doing my best to try and get to know her now. I never claimed I know more a lot about women than you do. Although I might as well do it now because I could be getting a girlfriend before a limp-wristed dick like you can. Sasuke turned to scoff it off and left with a puff of smoke, a grin plastered on his face as he vanished. Dickhead. The blonde remarked as he turned away and was stopped in his tracks when Jiraiya had appeared before him. I take it that you've been coming here for your parents. Naruto gave a simple nod. If it's any consolation, I apologize for not being there for you throughout most of your life. Naruto merely shrugged. I don't live in the past, Aero Senen, and I'd be a psychopath if I was. But some questions needed answering, and I think you're the one that can provide me with them. Jiraiya raised an eyebrow at this and replied, All right, go on then, shoot. What were my parents like? Jiraiya scratched the back of his head and gave Naruto his much awaited answer. Naruto learned much from his master. He learned that Minato was like him in learning style. Minato learned by doing much like he was although his father took it better than he did. His father was much more inquisitive. He explored many avenues of the shinobi arts before settling with Fuinjutsu when Kashina came into play. Minato excelled in many of them, but it was in Fuinjutsu that his genius shined. Paired with a sharp mind was his skill and finesse all around. He was also a very cheerful person, approachable and friendly when off-duty but his sense of duty and professionalism was something else during missions. He was decisive and moved sharply. It was why the Horaishin no Jutsu was something that easily complimented him. It was said that Minato was so good at the Jutsu that he surpassed the Nadaim Hokage in usage and took it further. The village loved but his enemies cowered before him. Kashina, though, in contrast to his father, was more untamed. She had full knowledge of Uzumaki-style Fuinjutsu and used it effectively throughout the battlefield. She was self-taught, something that Naruto thought was cool. Though she was skilled in Fuinjutsu practice and theory, she also had a temper to go along with her skill making her one of the most dangerous people that enemy shinobi would come across in the battlefield. Her most powerful trait though, was her ability to restrain Biju Chakra with her own. It was a rare trait within the Uzumaki clan, a clan that existed once outside the borders of Haino Kuni that was now left in ruins. The Shodaim Hokage's wife also displayed this unique ability and Naruto was somewhat disappointed that he didn't develop anything like it. But one thing that stuck with Naruto's mind though, was Jiraiya's words to him at the end of his story, your parents, they loved you the moment they found out Kashina was pregnant. Your dad would dote on your mom and your mom would buy almost everything that she could reach of the highest quality just for you and wouldn't accept anything less. She wanted to spoil you so badly when you were out. Your father was preparing for many things too, in the event of his absences being Hokage. 
He was preparing a small training area and a place where you could play inside the tower whenever your mother was out. He was excited. They both were. I guess that's what parenthood does to you. They were over the moon for you, kid. Naruto simply lowered his head and smiled as he closed his eyes. God damn it. I was prepared to hate them if ever things were different. That way, it'd be much easier for me to accept all the shit I've been through. But hearing that they really were doing absolutely everything for me even before I was born, I... Tears began to fall. Naruto was shaking as he kneeled down and grasped the green grass beneath his feet. I'm absolutely fucking happy. Jiraiya closed his eyes at this as he stared at the full moon that night. Believe me kid, although there will be strange fuck-ups in this world, parents would more than likely love their children rather than hate them. It's a natural part of our lives. Even the most hardened of criminals, some of them would do anything for their children. It would be a several minutes more when Naruto would finally recover as he asked the old toad, why did you want to meet up with me, Aero Senen? I've received word that Akatsuki would be flying under the radar for the next three years. I don't know why, but it gives us ample time to prepare everyone for the coming storm. Unfortunately, I would have to adjust my spy network now that they know that I've got a mole to give me information. I've spoken to Tsunade about this and she agreed, we'd have to let you fly under the radar too. So what does that mean? Naruto asked and Jiraiya leaned down to Naruto's level. You're going to have to spend the next three years training with me to a place that I know. Naruto's eyes widened. I'm going away from Konoha. Jiraiya nodded. You have no other choice. But what about missions? Kid, Tsunade authorized this as a mission. She wants me to train you to have a chance in fighting S-ranked criminals. Three years of uninterrupted training. I'll whip you into shape real good. I've already planned out what you'll be learning. By the time I'm done with you you'll be contending with the best of them. If Itachi was any indication, this trip is what you exactly need. Naruto scowled when he heard Itachi's name, what will I be learning? Jiraiya merely replied with a grin, mostly shinobi arts that are outside the main three. The sages of Myobokuzen are interested in meeting you and I'm willing to devote my time in teaching you an art that you were supposed to learn under your parents. You mean, Fuenjutsu? Yes. You'll be learning how to make seals, how to apply them and what does what. It's a fairly complicated art, one that would actually take years of study, but with your training method, we can shorten the time of you entering a novice to proficiency. You've been keeping up with your elemental manipulation. Naruto nodded and Jiraiya nodded as well, good. Because now would be a good time for you to learn that the Rasengan was an incomplete jutsu. Naruto's mind paused at that. What? Jiraiya grinned. That's right, the Rasengan was meant to be a technique that would take shape manipulation to its extreme and well as its form manipulation. Unfortunately, Minato's abrupt death has stopped it from realizing its true potential. So now, I'm willing that you make good on your old man's work and in turn, create a new jutsu with your own hands. Naruto's eyes sparkled in amazement. The feeling of excitement was surging through his bones like electricity. The chance to get stronger for him to stand a chance to survive against Akatsuki, a chance to be ever closer to his dream, and a chance to become even more powerful, this was an opportunity too good to pass up. An image of Hinata appeared in his mind for a moment and he paused. His thoughts on training for three whole years were derailed as he looked at the elder ninja. When are we leaving? Naruto asked as Jiraiya began approaching the stone monument. I'm awaiting the report on my network concerning Odo in a few days and I have a study session with Tsunade during that time concerning the cursed seal we're doing everything we can right now for something big. So that's about five days in total, kid. That would be enough for you to say your goodbyes. Naruto hardened his gaze at the man before he gave a silent nod as he turned back home, the promise of strength filling his veins like liquid fire. This time, he would not lose. Two days later. More than a week passed since Naruto's sudden return and those that were injured during Sasuke's mission were discharged from the hospital with a clean bill of health, though they still had to wear some bandages on their bodies. Naruto took this opportunity to treat all of his peers once again at Yakiniku Q as form of reunion after a grueling crisis. He was surprised that Sasuke had willingly come on his own and Sakura less hostile towards Sasuke and more amicable as of late. Ino and Shikamaru were helping Choji sit down on chair in one of the tables and given his current shape, it was quite a shock to Naruto that Choji lost a lot of weight during his battle with Jirobo, 
He hadn't learned about Choji's technique and what he had to do to make him look like he was now but he was showing signs of recovery at least. Kiba, Shino and Hanada followed suit. Hanada greeted him with a smile on her face as Kiba nudged Naruto with a slight elbow and a sly grin making the blonde boy blush ever so slightly before being dragged away by Shino to a seat. He noticed that Kiba wasn't with Akamaru for a moment and Shino answered for him that Akamaru was resting at their home in Hana's care. Apparently, Akamaru didn't come out unscathed as well. Neji, Tenten and Lee followed suit, all of them were in bandages even Lee had some across his torso that reached all the way to his neck. He had been training for a few days after his release from the hospital earlier than Neji and Choji's and he had been working hard non-stop. Lee explained that he was working with Guy about discovering new taijutsu styles that would supplement the Gokan and make him a much more formidable opponent. Naruto noted that this team received the brunt of injuries the most. As an additional surprise, Gara, Tamari and Konkuro were in attendance as well, Gara quietly sat just beside the table of Team Guy as Tamari waved at Tenten amicably and then to Shikamaru while Konkuro wondered how loaded Naruto was to have an entire restaurant closed all for them. When Konkuro found out that Naruto had basically the luck blessed by the goddess of fortune, the puppet user felt green with envy. The whole thing started off well, jokes and insults were thrown around and laughter was present. Sasuke had directly asked Naruto of what he was thinking. What's the occasion, Dobi? Naruto merely grinned and scratched the back of his head, I'm sorry, I was hoping to put this off until the very end of the whole party but I guess I can't exactly hide everything from you guys, huh? Naruto, what are you rambling on about? Sakura asked with a raised eyebrow. Naruto's face then turned serious, Aero Senen came back two days ago and he received word that Akatsuki would remain under the radar for the next three years, giving us preparation time in order to come up with a counter strategy to fight against them. At the moment most of his peers had heard the word Akatsuki, all eyes were already on him. The Sand siblings were also looking at him but rather more curiously as compared to the serious looks everyone else was giving. You may have heard this already, but that organization is after the tailed beasts. Old Lady Tsunade assigned me on a mission to be taught under Aero Senen for three years abroad. I'll be leaving in three days. Tamari and Konkuro looked concerned for their brother who was looking intently at the blonde. Everyone else looked somewhat nervous and others looked angry. So you're saying this because, Choji trailed off and Neji answered for Naruto, he wants us to prepare ourselves too for the inevitability that we will have to face Akatsuki. Naruto gave a nod. I was lucky I managed to get out alive mostly in one piece but whatever happened to me, I don't want to happen to anyone else, to any one of you. That's why I want to see you guys after three years, strong enough that you can beat them. I believe in every single one of you and you'll do well when this is all over, I want to see everyone alive after we deal with them. I want you all at my inauguration when the time comes. He said that last sentence with a grin forcing the others to do the same. To hell with that. I'm the one who's going to be Hokage. Kiba remarked loudly. As the get-together slowly trickled down and people began leaving one by one, with Sand siblings going first and Gara's reaffirmation that he will aim to be K's cage, followed by Team 10, then Team Guy all saying their goodbyes. Kiba and Shino left first before Sasuke and Sakura left, leaving behind just Naruto and Hinata. Naruto had a smile on his face as he looked outside the window. The company of friends had soothed his anxiety at least. Hanada wanted to say something, but no words escaped her lips that moment. Naruto turned to her and he smiled. Hanada, I want you to come with me to a place where a good friend of mine once showed me. Hanada readily complied. To Hanada, her meetings and bonding with Naruto was living on borrowed time now. After that, he will be gone for three years. Three long and painful years without him and Hanada was putting up a brave front. She wanted to remain resolute and strong, a core of steel within her gentle features. When they arrived, Naruto pointed over the horizon and saw the lights littering below the mountain, the sight of a thousand or so tiny little speckles of light with some moving to and fro at the busy streets of the village made for a spectacle. She had realized, Naruto had taken her to the top of the Hokage monument. The boy sat at the edge of the cliff looking over the lights below and looking up towards a star-ridden sky. Naruto motioned for Hanada to sit beside him. Hanada complied as Naruto apologized, I'm sorry you had to know that I was leaving. But I had no choice. I don't want those blasted Akatsuki members laying a hand on this village or on anyone from here. I I understand, really, 
I do, but seeing you leave is the last thing that I want even though you're back for only two weeks or so. Naruto smiled at her as she blushed. You know, the more that you say that you don't want me to leave, makes it more difficult for me to leave. Hinata stuttered at that, I I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Naruto merely grinned at her and said, it's not a bad thing Hinata, I like the fact there's someone here in the village who wants me around. Naruto then looked up the stars. I've never had someone like that before, you know. Someone who wanted me to stay with them, it feels nice, being needed like this. Hinata then stealing herself, made a bold move and grabbed Naruto's left hand with her right as she leaned her head on his left shoulder, looking down on the streets below, seeing the movement of the small lights beneath her feet. Silence sat between the two and Hinata finally mustered enough courage to Naruto. I don't want you to go. Naruto looked at Hinata beside him, she was now clinging on his shirt tightly. He held her hand tighter. I know. Why can't you stay? It's because I want to keep everyone safe. Even if it means that I can't be near you. Hinata, you know. Please don't answer me with that. Naruto, meanwhile, just smiled and changed the way he was going to deliver his message instead. You'll do well even without me, you know. Hinata looked at Naruto surprised and a question escaped from her lips, W what? You're strong Hinata, I don't need to remind you every time and I often ask myself why you would bother with someone like me. You're more than that. A blush had appeared on Hinata's face. Caught up in his emotions, Naruto said the words he didn't mean to say to the girl who was with him now. You don't realize that I'm the one who needs you more than you need me. Hinata suddenly closed the gap in between them the sudden rise of emotions was slowly taking over her. What she was feeling was overwhelming, to say the least. Naruto suddenly felt like kicking himself when he said those words, he hadn't meant to spill the beans. But his mouth spoke before he could even come up with something to make light of the situation. Naruto-kun, the moment that you were on the ground, bleeding and slowly losing your consciousness, that time, I realized something. Naruto asked her as she turned to face him and held his hands together with her own. What, if I were to lose you, I would lose myself. I would be in despair. The thought of you disappearing brings me grief of great magnitude that I thought I myself would die. Hanada, I was only brought out of my sadness when father took us to mother's grave and there he said that when she died, part of him died along with her but he had to endure that pain. And so, I promised myself that I would grow strong and fight those who took you away from me. Hanada then wrapped her arms around Naruto to his waist, surprising the boy for a moment. It was an empty existence for me. I could not find that one thing that would bring forth color back into my eyes until you returned home, back to me. Hanada inched closer and closer, her emotions were peaking as she said every heartfelt emotion she had for the boy. So don't say that you need me more than I need you, Naruto-kun. Because it is the same for me, I don't want to lose you. I may be young but I fully understand that what I feel for you, if I were to lose such, I would be nothing more. I I I I'm in love with you, Naruto-kun. And with those words, she sealed her statement with a chaste kiss on his lips. The touch of her lips was brief but so strong. Naruto was seemingly overwhelmed as emotions of Hinata's affection poured over him like a gush of a waterfall. She saw his face, blushing deep crimson and surprised by such intimate contact. He didn't exactly know what to do. It was sudden and he was taken by surprise as Hinata stood up and bowed deeply at Naruto before she went and ran straight home, a blush on her face as well. Naruto tried to reach out but Hinata was already gone by the time he recovered. The blonde looked out and gave a sigh, love, huh. The boy felt his lips with his right hand and he could still feel the lingering touch of Hinata's lips on his. They were warm and sweet. It was only for a moment and he could already tell that something sparked inside of him, like he had just been filled with a million suns. Butterflies were now filling his stomach and for another time, Naruto blushed at the contact that he had made. Hanada. The next day, he had wanted to go to the Hyuga compound and talk to Hanada but found it impossible. Every time he would try, he would get cold feet and he would pace and would be distraught of what he needed to say. He had approached Aruka since morning but the teacher was too busy with school. Naruto internally cursed and decided to think about it more as he went to the training grounds to clear his mind. When he arrived, Naruto saw Sakura reading up on several scrolls given to her by Tsunade and calmly approached her. Ah, Naruto, are you about to train here, now? 
Just let me clear my stuff for a few minutes and you should be. Sakura, I want to ask you something. Naruto interrupted her pausing Sakura for a second. Sakura looked at him with a curious gaze and Naruto looked to his side, I have a problem. Hanada confessed to you and did something that took you by surprise. She asked. Naruto looked at her suspiciously and asked his teammate. How did you know about that? Did you spy on US last night? Sakura merely gave a soft laugh and waved off Naruto's accusation and gestured for him to sit down which Naruto complied. Of course not, silly. I just know it because it's a woman's intuition, that and the fact that I was bluffing. So what happened last night? Sakura asked that last part with a giddy face and looking like she was watching a romance film. Naruto leaned back as Sakura had stars in her eyes, intent on prying the information from her teammate, asked him, she kissed you, didn't she? Oh no, I'm not answering that, it's an obvious bait for me to say, yes. Naruto remarked, then a few seconds later, had covered his mouth with a blush on his face and a feeling of dread as Sakura gave him a sly grin. So you two did kiss. Oh my god that is just so cute I could just, Sakura was now going full on squealing as she asked Naruto again, so, what's the problem? You and Hinata are officially an item now so. We're not, Sakura. Sakura blinked, her joy turning into something akin to pure outrage. What do you mean, you're not? The hell did you do, you idiot? Naruto was suddenly shuddering from Sakura's outburst. You have five seconds to explain yourself. How dare you take away a girl's first kiss and then walk away so casually, it was enough for you to take away Sasuke-kun's. Hold it right there. Don't remind me about that last one. Bleg, I've repressed that memory a long time ago. Let's not dwell on the past and focus now. As soon as Sakura began shaking Naruto, the blonde sang like a canary to Sakura and told her everything that happened past the send-off party last night. Honestly, I'm more surprised that someone like you wouldn't know what to say to her even if she's been so dead set on being with you since the academy. You could literally say the most unromantic stuff to her and she'd be putty in your hands. Sakura hummed a little and looked up, thinking of ideas to help her teammate for this big problem. Yeah, the bad thing is, I have to pack all of my stuff because I'm leaving first thing tomorrow morning. I don't have enough time to talk to her and I feel like whatever strong face I would put up in front of her. I'd fail at it and make myself look like an idiot. Sakura gave him a deadpan look, an idiot like you trying to save face from looking like an idiot is kind of redundant, Naruto. Naruto clicked his tongue at that, his pride was wounded by Sakura's comment and he could only give a short reply, whatever. Then an idea entered Sakura's head, like a light bulb being turned on with a switch. Naruto, where exactly are you going to meet Jiraiya-sama tomorrow? You can pack today and make sure you secure your stuff and prepare yourself for tomorrow, both with Hinata and your journey. You can leave the details here, I'll do something about Hinata, just make sure you get your head in the game tomorrow morning, alright? Naruto paused for a bit as Sakura gave him a blank scroll to write all the details that she wanted. Once he was done, he gave the scroll back to Sakura and shooed him away as she grabbed another empty scroll and began writing. Sakura smiled. Naruto had realized his feelings already, he just didn't have the means on how to express them. She had seen just how much Naruto lacked in identifying social cues and noticed how desperate he was for the kind of affection that would result in accepting his whole being mistakes and all. Sakura knew that if there was someone who could fill that empty void in Naruto's heart, it wouldn't be her, she was too forceful and she would force Naruto to change who he was and he would be miserable for it. Sakura also only saw Naruto as a friend and never beyond it, maybe a brother to her, but most certainly not something more platonic. But Hinata, though, Hinata was different. Sakura could see the admiration Hinata had for Naruto even if he was obnoxious. Whenever Naruto would speak, she would notice Hinata would pay close attention and when she practiced, she would try to mimic Naruto's mannerisms and would persevere. She saw Naruto for who he was and had come to form a connection with him on a level that she and Sasuke could not reach or mimic. She saw it in their interactions, how Naruto would mellow down, smile more sincerely and not be loud, patiently waiting for Hinata to speak. She watched as Naruto slowly opened up to Hinata and saw how Hinata kept trying to ease his doubts away little by little. Hinata had crawled into Naruto's heart and he never noticed nor minded at all. Instead, Naruto took it and kept it close within him even though he didn't know how to express it. As she wrote the letter, 
She looked at herself at her best imitation of Naruto's handwriting and nodded to herself. She would later hand it over to the Hyuga compound's guards and gave specific instructions to give it to Hinata as soon as they see her. That night, Hinata had just arrived from her training with teammate who was back in action after several days of rest with Kurenai being stricter than usual in her training methods. One of the guards had handed her a scroll with her name written meaning it was addressed to her. Looking at it curiously and noticing Naruto's handwriting, she decided to open it once she had reached her room. When she reached her room, she placed the scroll on her desk and after a quick shower to freshen up. When she went for the scroll, she grew hesitant for a brief moment and went back to her bed looking at the scroll intently. For several hours, Hinata kept thinking to herself just how hesitant she was in reading Naruto's letter. Dinner had passed and soon, it was late in the night and Hinata kept thinking about the contents of the letter and asked herself why Naruto didn't approach her directly like he used to. With a sigh, she looked at the clock, it was already midnight. Her fatigue and fretting over Naruto's letter exhausted her and she slumped down on her bed and finally let sleep take over her. That night, Hinata slept dreamless, drifting off into nothing. Morning came by and the sun's rays soon reached over to Hinata's room, waking her up. Suddenly, she looked at the letter and finally had enough courage to open the scroll and read its contents. She was wide-eyed and looked at the time, it was already 7 in the morning. He's leaving very shortly, Hinata got up put on some clothes and jumped out the window as she jumped from roof to roof with the intent of meeting up with Naruto shortly. Oni-sama, it's morning. It's time for breakfast. Hanabi opened up the door and noticed no one there. She looked at the scroll that was unceremoniously dropped on the floor and read it out loud. Hanada, I can't express how well I've gotten close to you since after the Chunin exams. You are something, all right. I know that what happened the last time we were together, I didn't know what to say. Mostly because I'm an idiot and I don't have the words to say something to you that night, but I've been thinking about it. I really thought about it. And I can't say it in the letter because then I wouldn't be able to say it to you properly. I want to see you Hanada, before I go. I have to see you, in order to tell you everything. I'll be by the eastern gate waiting for you until 7 if you want to hear it. If not, then it's okay. I would understand. I'll try but this will be our last chance in meeting before I come back in three years. I guess Nei Sama would be having breakfast later. I'm sure father wouldn't mind. Hanabi said offhandedly and closed the scroll in her hands before setting it on Hanada's table with a smile on her lips. Hanada had arrived just by the eastern gate, her Byakugan active as she looked around for a tussle of spiky blonde hair. Immediately, she noticed a boy with blonde hair trailing behind a tall white-haired man that she could identify as Jiraiya of the Sani. She once again filled herself with courage and went after Naruto. As she came within hearing distance, she shouted at the blonde. Naruto-kun. Naruto turned around, his face of solemnity replaced by joy as he finally saw Hinata. He looked back at his sensei who merely grinned and gestured that he would wait by the gate's walls as Naruto looked back at Hinata who ran to him and stopped just a meter away from him and gathered her breath from the exhaustive run that she did from her house to the gate at full speed. Hinata, I have to tell you something. Hinata looked up as Naruto smiled at him with his most sincere smile and continued, I've been thinking about you since yesterday, I couldn't get you out of my head. I know I wanted to tell you something but I had no idea what it was until I could gather my thoughts since yesterday. Hinata listened intently as he looked away, a blush on his face as he looked at the left hand that Hinata had held since they saw each other last. Why you don't have to force yourself, Naruto-kun. Naruto cut her off with a shake of his head with a smile as he closed his eyes and said, No, I'm not. It was wrong of me to not give you a response since that night. I don't want you to be left hanging for three years without as much as a reply. You don't deserve something like that. Naruto then looked at her directly as he said, I always thought to myself that if I change the way I am, maybe someone will come along and give me the kind of warmth that I wanted to have for so long. Naruto shook his head, but that would be impossible. That person wouldn't love me for being me, no. She would love that version of me, simply because if she would start to see me falling apart, it would result in her leaving me and being left alone again. But you're different, Hanada. Even if you had known about my secret, you didn't care. You still wanted to be with an idiot like me. In some ways, I'm glad, so happy that I met you and you would stick with me, made me feel being needed. 
You made me feel something that is different from everyone else. Naruto looked to his left as he saw people bustling in and out of the gate. He smiled. I don't know exactly what these feelings are. But the thought of not seeing you hurts me inside. The thought of you forgetting about me would hurt me more than anything ever could. At this, Naruto bowed in front of Hanada. But what it is telling me is that I want you to stay with me, Hanada. For as long as it takes, I want to know this more because every time I'm with you, I feel this. I feel this overwhelming sense of joy and comfort when I'm with you. I care for you so much that if I saw you get hurt because of me, I can never forgive myself. I'm an idiot and I carry with me my terrible past and an uncertain future. I don't want to lose you. I don't want that damned Akatsuki to use you to get to me. It's going to be really hard for me and you deserve someone who's not an idiot like me. Why you idiot? Naruto looked up as Hinata was now half a meter away before she lightly slapped him on the cheek and then embracing him with all of her might with her face leaning on Naruto's shoulder. Someone like you deserves all the love that you need. Hinata said as Naruto stood there, flabbergasted. You have genuine care for others and you keep trying even if you fail multiple times. Hinata then looked straight at Naruto's eyes and said, even if the road is filled with perils, I would rather travel it with you than to not have you with me. Hinata, please, let me be by your side. I. Naruto's head was soon overrun with memories of him with Hinata and the emotions he had inside as he reciprocated her hug once more. I promise. Naruto finally gave in. Hey, Naruto, say your goodbyes to your girlfriend already. We need to go now. Jiraiya shouted from afar, earning a look from the two as he turned back with a smirk. Naruto then turned back as Hinata once more gathered her courage and proceeded to close the gap between the two of them. Hinata then once more gave Naruto a chaste kiss on the lips. Naruto was surprised for a moment, but mentally prepared himself and proceeded to return Hinata's chaste kiss. They looked at each other tenderly before finally stopping, letting their sensibilities take over. Naruto then let go of the hug and promised one day he would return to Hinata. He looked up and saw the face of the fourth Hokage in the monument and he promised for his father and mother, that he would grow stronger in order to protect his friends, his family, and his entire village. Watch me, I'll come back home stronger. With that, the boy turned his back on the girl heading out to the gates, head held high as he was greeted by his master who was grinning from ear to ear, with a small notebook and pen in his hands. And Naruto kicked the old man behind his left leg causing the old man to stumble a little and pounding the blonde with his fist. On the rooftops, all of his peers watched as Naruto exited out of the village gate before being obscured by the large arc. His lingering shadow gave them all a wave, a fist to the sky and a wordless promise. Many of them gave a nod and some gave a smile, while others looked serious. It was wordlessly established between them that if it was anyone who had the right to lead them, then it was their friend departing for somewhere else, to be hidden for three years. He may be simple-minded at times, but they knew better. Naruto will be the one who will lead them all and they have come to acknowledge him as a comrade, as a superior, but most of all, a true friend. Sasuke looked at Sakura who was looking down at the streets of Konoha with a cheerful smile before he looked back towards the Hokage monument, Naruto's advice still lingering inside his head. A small smile etched on his face as he dons his new mask and vanishing in a swirl of leaves, preparing for another grueling trial. There was no rest for the weary. Unknown place. Nine figures phased into existence as static began to distort the outlines of their shadows inside a small cave filled with overgrowing rock formations. Only the color of their eyes can be seen as well as the red patterned clouds emblazoned on their long coats. It seems you were not as thorough as you had hoped, Itachi. One of the voices mentioned. It came from the man whose eyes were concentric and the noble color of purple painting them. The one whose eyes were red and glowing in the dark replied stoically. The bleeding that the Jinchuriki of the Kayubi suffered through was guaranteed fatal. I have seen enough of Kisami's performance to tell if he aims to kill or not. But I have never realized just how much tenacity a boy of his age has. It has become apparent that he will become one of our prime targets. The one with the giant sword merely gave a small chuckle and spoke, I thought the boy was suicidal when he decided to damage himself further by pulling out all of Samahata's skin stuck in his flesh. Apparently his healing ability should not be taken lightly. The one who looked like he had a deformity on his back then spoke swishing his tail dangerously as he did so, then this predicament confirms that he is of Uzumaki descent. Aside from the Senju, 
There are no lineages within the elemental nations that spoke of greater vitality than the Uzumaki. One of the men spoke his teal green eyes turned to the man with the humpback, so the remnants of that clan still lingers, it is a crying shame that most of their members have died out due to the great wars. Their hearts would have made for a fine collection to my arsenal. It is of no importance, yeah. I mean now. This means that capturing the biju shouldn't be difficult with it still being inside an unskilled brat, yeah. The one looking down from the ceiling spoke. Then, the one with the ornamental design on her head spoke, an uncontrolled biju is much more manageable than a jinchuriki running amok. At least when it is a biju, all it has are its own abilities. A jinchuriki would have that arsenal and then some. Underestimating them can become a fatal mistake, especially with enough skills like the jinchuriki of the eight tails. Then, the one with the scythe asked the group with a rather rude comment, what's with flying under everyone's radar, anyway? Why are we taking three years of break just to capture the fucking jinchuriki? The one with the rippling eyes turned to the one with the scythe and answered him, we are gathering resources. Pretty soon we will be going independent from the grasp of the elemental nations in favor on finally focusing on our goals. Three years is a very short time to reorganize our mode of operations, focusing all our manpower in spying the Jinchuriki and finally having the five great nations under our thumb. Remember that the path of righteousness is met with both the sword and an olive branch. Control yourself, new member. The one with the scythe clicked his tongue. At all costs, we must avert all suspicions placed on us. Two of the five nations already know who our targets are going to be, it is safe to assume that Taki has also been warned of our motives. Suna, Konoha and Taki will be the least of our priorities. For now, Iwa, Kumo and Kiri must come first. The one with the Sharingan squinted his eyes for a moment before his visage dissolved as the rest of the members followed suit. The one with the purple rippling eyes then looks upward before vanishing himself but left behind a message within the small cave. The age of the shinobi countries is now coming to an end. And Akatsuki will be there, setting the new dawn for the world. Chapter 18. Book 2. Metamorphosis Part 1. Book 2. Awakening. The second book, Awakening, tells the story of our heroes growing stronger through different means. These means are divided by four arcs for different people with their own themes. If book one is the divergent point, the second book would talk about the kinds of adventures that people have in life and the different facets of challenges presented to them. The first arc talks about change through discovery and innovation. It talks about people who are basically pioneers and innovators, what they can bring to the table and what they can see beyond a closed box of ideas. The progress that they go through goes without saying that they had a little help but most of the nitty-gritty details fall on themselves. Arc 1. Metamorphosis Part 1. The greatest of warriors are those who inspire others with their tales of heroism and human struggle. This group of young children, crossing into the unknown territories of adulthood, discover the struggle in their paths as they try to catch up to their ideals. 1. 2. 1. 2. 1. 2. Every day is a routine for people like Meta Guy and Rock Lee. They get up even before the sun shows its rays upon the village and they begin their day with a long-distance jog. No warm-ups, no stretches, not even breathing exercises. They had gotten used to do jogs into very far distances that their bodies just seemingly obey to their will without much of a problem, more so to Guy as he had been doing his routine for most of his life. As for Lee, being in top physical form is vital to his career and his life. Lee had been born with small chakra pathways making it impossible for him to emit chakra outside of his body but he can still manipulate it inside which is why he can still perform simple chakra exercises such as climbing trees and water walking. But even those were extremely difficult to do for him. Guy had given him chances there every step of the way and it was the reason why Lee could keep up with his peers. They would always run by the Karama clan property and the clan head would always watch them with eyes of contempt but would greet them nonetheless. Lee would always ask Guy what it was that the old man from the Karama household had against them and Guy would say that the man despised those without talent. Lee would look down and he would frown but Guy would reassure him that Lee had other matters that he had to focus on and that a man who he did not know shouldn't affect him in the least. Lee, even though he could never do a proper jutsu, and probably never will, is always at the top of his game concerning taijutsu. Few people in his generation could match him in a battle of speed, in a test of endurance and in a show of force in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He was proud of that feat. Even Neji had acknowledged his prowess. 
After Naruto's departure from Konoha, Lee had further increased his training and he confided in Guy that he had discovered something while he was battling the supposed leader of the Sound Four. He had given birth to a new technique. Guy had never been more proud of his student that day. For he knew Lee truly was talented and the type of talent Lee presented was far different than what others considered as prodigies like Neji and Sasuke. No, Lee was not just a master of hard work, he was a master of application. Being forced into a situation like Lee, Guy could understand why Lee's mindset was like that. He was trying to improve on age-old wisdom and it paid off in dividends for him. Hue to many manly tears and an open sunset with the rage of a huge wave crashing on the shore as the two of them hugged. Manly. Suddenly, Lee wasn't actually a hopeless case at all. To make matters more interesting, Lee had been going to the hospital for at least once or twice a week for Shizun to check on his peculiar case. His condition was rare and the people of the Medical Research Institute were interested to study his particular defect. Guy was now sure that given time, Lee would surpass him in many ways and the glimmer of hope that the top leading researchers in the medical research lab would help him find a way. To Guy, this was his reward for his work. To see Lee to ascend to heights that was previously unimaginable. Lee's potential seemed to change that day. When the rays of sunlight finally did arrive, Lee and Guy were already at the training grounds, performing intensive sets of workouts like push-ups, pull-ups, curls, squats, weights, and everything that they could do. They would often be dripping with sweat by now but fatigue had yet to set in. When they were done, they would practice punches, kicks, weapons and kata. After that were lectures. Guy had emphasized to Lee that not only were these important, it showed to Lee that Goken was not merely an art, but also a philosophy. And Lee would listen to them intently and hung on every word he said. Lee was an eager learner and that eagerness reciprocated more energy from Guy to teach. Now, however, Guy was teaching Lee something different. He had once opened it to Lee before and the thought of Lee discovering himself on new horizons was something that both he and his student were eagerly anticipating. He could still recall his lecture to his student back then concerning the Goken and Lee's eventual wall. Goken is indeed a very forceful and powerful taijutsu to have. It emphasizes quick speed and very powerful strikes in a matter of seconds or less. It is the epitome of using the body to its limit becoming a weapon yourself and destroying your enemies with fists alone. However, Goken is still one taijutsu art and that taijutsu art is not excused to linearity when it comes to fighting opponents. If you wish to continue the path of taijutsu, Lee, then you must learn beyond the understandings and philosophy of Goken. You must discover your own strength, the strength of perseverance, one where you will be in a domain much different than I. What Guy could do at this point in his current position, was to only guide Lee now. He had shown Lee everything he needed to learn about Goken and the Eight Gates. It was time to see Lee grow on his own without his help. Guy watched as Lee clumsily sifts through a kata he had designed on his own. Guy had heard from Neji that Lee took some advice from him concerning his taijutsu philosophy and noticed that Lee did have some form of the juken, gentle fist, within his stances and forms. Guy watched as Lee, instead of using his feet to move at high speeds in linear patterns and attacking with them, he would use them for more flexible range for movement and expanding his base and creating more power behind his blows. The similarities with Jukin, however, end with Lee's lowered and widened stance for stability. The rest was a mix of Goken and his own style. It took Lee a whole year to even come up with a working style that he could write about in his journal logs and in scrolls as well. Guy had mentioned that he should write every progress he has made and so far, it has been 10 scrolls and counting. When they had finally stopped for the day, Guy had Lee go through a session with the Medical Research Center for an evaluation by the Hokage's capable assistant. Once there, Shizun and her team would run tests on Lee, seeing if he could emit chakra enough to perform jutsu. Every time that they would come here, the tests would often fail and that the furthest that Lee could use chakra aside from control exercises where on his muscles whose muscle fibers grew when fed with Lee's chakra. For the first few days on Lee's evaluation, he would look slightly disheartened. But not overly so, he knew he couldn't use chakra and the hope that the hospital had given him was enough for Lee to keep fighting. Today though, instead of having Lee emit chakra to perform a simple kawarimi, Shizun asked something different. Would you like to learn how to heal yourself? That seemed to catch Lee's attention. He had heard before from Sakura that medical jutsu needed precise pinpoint accuracy of control to even be decent. Unfortunately, 
Even though Li has enough control to do water walking and tree climbing, he had no means of emitting chakra in the first place so the idea of healing seemed like a moot point to him. So the best response Li could come up with to Shizun was a flat out, what? There is a jutsu that we encountered about a year ago when Tsunade-sama and I were still on the road and we were fighting off Yukushi Kabuto and Orochimaru. It's a regenerative technique that involves restoring the basal layer of the skin up to the epidermis, the muscle fibers and even the lining walls on the stomach can completely heal. It requires very little chakra to use but it is hard to master and the control could purposely be difficult as well. You've seen it before, right? It was the same procedure we used on you. But we believe you can do it, Lee San. It's a technique that is more in line with your current moveset. The question is whether or not you will take the risk and skip through the steps in practical application of healing and discuss more in theory with them until we deem you are proficient enough to learn the technique. Needless to say, Guy and Lee were ecstatic to have a go at the thing. He would be studying very hard but Lee knew the payoff was worth it. Ooh oh. Guy Sensei. This is an opportunity that I will not waste. All of my hard work will pay off. I will do my best and overcome this hurdle with hard work. Lee. Your work has done wonders for you as a shinobi. I have no doubt that you will succeed in this task. Let your youth give you the fuel to keep burning bright. Guy Sensei. Lee. Guy Sensei. Lee. Guy Sensei. Cue to another manly hug with streams of tears falling down their faces as a sunset appears in the open background and huge waves crashing on the open shore. Please be silent and get out of my hospital quietly. Shizun promptly kicked them out. Shizun had also given him a form and some requirements needed for his enrollment for the course, their classes start in the next two days and he was giddy with anticipation. Unfortunately, he would also have to take into account a uniform that consists of something long and comfortable like a coat. They weren't necessarily strict on uniform they just wanted the course taker to have something that can protect them if there was spillage of something nasty. Now Lee had to adjust his timetable to meet with the demands of this new schedule. Lee could still train, but the long hour of jogging would be terribly reduced as well as the stretches and the warm-ups in favor of Guy's lectures on Taijutsu philosophy, practice and then the lectures on medical jutsu by Shizun's group. Of course, Lee was not without his own days of downtime, though. He would do his hobby of weight lifting for one or two hours and go out with his friends for a bath in the hot springs or eat out and enjoy something. Lee had noticed that quite a number of his peers were either on a mission or had gone out to do some sort of errand that concerns their respective clan members. I heard Kiba asked for a leave a few days ago and that was why no one seen him in the village yet. Tenton remarked as she ate her bowl of cold soba noodles. Strange. Hanada-sama took Hanabi-sama to one of her mother's old homes to the south yesterday. She had been fretting that she had hit a wall in her training and Hiyashi-sama had asked the Hokage for her leave as well. I think she is near wave country at this point. He had said it was necessary for Hanada-sama and Hanabi-sama to learn the history of her mother's clan. Lee had raised an eyebrow at this, are you not supposed to be with them, Neji? Surely Hiyashi-sama would not just send anyone out with his two daughters away from Konoha like that even if Hinata-sama is a capable chunin. Ko-san is with them. Neji replied before drinking his tea, and Hinata-sama is no slouch as a fighter. I would dare say that she is more ruthless than me when it comes to fighting an opponent these days. Tenton shuddered at that, I saw her match at the chunin exam, I'm glad I didn't fight her. Her opponent from Kumo was asking for it, though. Neji replied at that, Kumo always asks for it. There is bad blood between Kumo Shinobi and the Hyuga in general. That or Hinata snapped when that Kumo Shinobi insulted her boyfriend even if he didn't know Naruto. Tenten replied with a nervous smile. Neji seemed to smirk at that, indeed, Hinata-sama is a lioness when it comes to him. It amuses me to think that Hinata-sama could do that to those dastardly Shinobi from Kumo. What really surprised me was that Sasuke-kun took part in the exam too, isn't he in Anbu now? Lee asked, looking up as he ate his spicy curry. Tenton shrugged, from what I've heard he's close to finishing his course as a trainee. He just needed the Chunin title to make it official on his record that he joined Anbu when he became Chunin. Apparently, if your sensei is a former member and unit commander of the Anbu, you could recommend someone even as a genin. She frowned at that last statement and shook her head, Team 7 and its damned connections, I swear. It's not like Guy Sensei isn't keeping up, though. He's already put my name up as a nominee for Junin. Neji said this as he took another sip of his tea. 
Li and Tenton raised an eyebrow at this with Tenton asking, and you were going to tell us, when? Neji had a bead of sweat at the back of his head for this, as soon as it came up. Actually, I didn't know about it either until this morning when Azumo and Katetsu informed about it and showed me the form Guy Sensei submitted. But to be honest, I don't think I am quite ready for it. I'm sure Hokage-sama would reject that request. Tenten still having her eyebrow raised asked him, what gives, though? You're plenty good enough, as it is. You think you still have to master your Raiden ability. Neji gave a nod, I have yet to fully explore the abilities of Raiden Chakra. Kakashi Sensei gave a demonstration a few days ago and I wish to learn from him. There are still things I need to understand. Though he has given me enough pointers and I've read some books about some of its most useful applications. I think I can do it by the end of the year. Lee gave Neji a thumbs up. Go for it, Neji. You'll be a Junin in no time. His rival gave a smile. While I thank you for your encouragement, Lee. I think we've had enough for today. Let's get home for some rest, shall we? Yeah, and I have to go back to the research lab. I finally found the ore that we were looking for to finish that new weapon we're making. As the three said their goodbyes with Neji going the opposite direction, Tenten looked at Lee who was looking thoughtful about Neji's predicament. Don't take it too hard, Lee. I'm sure Guy Sensei recommended the three of us. He's like that. But you do know that Neji is an obvious choice, right? Lee nodded, his right hand clenching as he looked at it, I know. Even so, I do not wish to fall behind. Lee continued as he gave a punch forward, it was fast and the air gave a sound to his fist surging forward before he retracted it back just as quick. You're not the only one. Tenton remarked as she looked up, thinking of the days of their training when they were genin. Lee San. The two looked to their left to the source of their voice and found a girl with long brown hair wearing a pink kimono with a sash around her waist. Tenton could tell there was a thin layer of armor underneath her dress and raised an eyebrow. Akunoichi. But she doesn't have a headband. Yukumo-san. What can I do to help you? Lee asked. Tenton glanced at Lee suspiciously then back to the girl as she nudged Lee slightly with her shoulder. Seemingly taking the hint, Lee introduced her to Tenton. Ah. Do mind my manners, Yukumo-san, I apologize. I forgot to introduce you to each other. This is my teammate Tenten. Lee gestured to Tenten who gave a slight wave and Yukumo bowed deeply. It is an honor, Tenten-san. Tenten seemed to wave it off. Ah don't worry about manners, Yukumo-san. From the crest on your shoulders, you're from the Kurama clan, correct? Yukumo gave a slight smile. Indeed, I am. I am here for Lee San's tutoring to help me with my stamina. I was born with a frail body, you see. I do not wish to fall to illness or lay by the sidelines. I wish to become a shinobi. Lee gave a nod, Yash, now that you're here, we can walk to the training grounds. That was when Tenten decided to take her cue, nah, I'll pass on this one, Lee. I need to get by the R&D department. They've got some sick weapon designs that I need to go over and see what we can make from there. Tenton waved her hand as she left the two who looked at her confused before deciding to going for the training grounds. This was Lee on his resting periods, always training or at least exploring areas of training when discussing with his teammates. This was his dedication, his determination. Now, he was being presented with something that will change his life and he was diving headfirst in it. As Lee watched Yukumo do light exercises around the training ground such as jogging and stretches, Lee instructed her on some of the breathing techniques he used while on the run. She complied and tried to do the same as she ran. Yukumo made small progresses since her start over a year ago, her current physical ability was right about for an academy student about to graduate, bordering close to Genin. He had asked her once if she needed help in Taijutsu, she replied that indeed she needed help in that part but what she needed more was an evasion ability enough to avoid opponents and cast her arsenal from afar. Lee was rather confused at first as to what Kurama meant by her arsenal one time until she demonstrated her frightening ability to cast Genjutsu that can virtually trick the mind and cause enough pain that her illusions could trigger an organ malfunction and cause death. That was something Lee shuddered to think about. Yukumo had the potential to cause harm with just her illusions, a scary feat in itself. If Yukumo had that much potential, then why was she restrained to this point of weakness and be left into decay? It certainly didn't make sense to have her side lined as a civilian. Did her weak constitution have something to do with it? 
That would certainly be the case, but a weak constitution could be overcome even with enough training. Maybe it was time for Yukumo to consult a doctor by the hospital in order to see her condition. Yes, that would probably be for the best. Just being here and adding small increments to her slowly growing constitution would not do well if the root of the problem was not discovered. Yukumo-san, I would like to discuss with you that if you wish to continue with the training I'm giving you, a new proper schedule is needed for our training as I am about to undergo a program myself with the medical research lab. Yukumo tilted her head sideways, curious as to what Lee was talking about, what are they going to do? Apparently, they have found a loophole in my condition. Although I cannot emit chakra to perform jutsu to affect everything around me, I can actually perform any jutsu that concerns my body, in theory anyway. They wish to test it by having me learn about medical jutsu to heal any injured part of my body. It is very useful for someone like me and I wish to take this opportunity to grow stronger. During this time, I will still be in the hospital, attending lectures and studying until I am fit by their standards to learn about the jutsu. I apologize for any inconvenience that this might cause, but can you be awake at 4 in the morning? I want to help you in your condition but I cannot be present during times like this. Yukumo looked down, sullen from the news, the clan is very strict on timetables. I would have to find the proper time to escape and go back home without raising suspicion. I am not allowed to leave the compound, you see. Silence reigned in between them as the wind quietly whistles in the training ground. I see. Then I shall help you sneak out in the morning. I cannot deny someone who is willing to put the effort in being a shinobi. Lee declared loudly and as his right hand closed into a fist and shaking furiously. I will not abandon someone who wishes to be in the prime of their youth. Lee then gave Yukumo a thumbs up, his nice guy pose, I swear to you, Yukumo-san, I will make you into a shinobi. On the honor of the mighty green beast. Ooh oh. oh. And so, Lee swore to himself that he would improve both Yukumo and himself as he prepared to enter what was essentially a school for medics. He woke up on the day of the first lecture seminar, training as usual early in the morning, this time, starting earlier with Yukumo for about an hour after helping her sneaking out of the compound before joining Guy in one of their crazy runs. Although their sessions had gotten shorter except for the lecture with Guy, their exercises were much more intense. When he got home to prepare for the seminars at the hospital, Lee took a shower to wash away the sweat and to smell fresh on his first day. After finishing up, he wore a black versus neck sleeveless shirt over mesh wire armor and dark green long pants that were loose fitting and tapped just below the kneecap to where his weights and sandals were. He grabbed the black Changshan style shirt with white outlines and buttons that would serve as his protective gear once he's inside the building. The Changshan reached just behind his knees and grabbed a big leather belt to wrap it around his waist. It was a shame that he would not be able to use his beloved jumpsuit anymore now with the building holding proper decorum to its own staff and students. Guy had almost, almost, declined their offer if not for Lee's willingness to learn more. So Guy resigned to himself when Lee was forced to wear normal clothes for once, although Guy insisted that Lee wore his jumpsuit whenever it came to training. The morning sessions became grueling but Lee persevered through and through it all, he trained Yukumo and even advised the girl to seek help once more in an improved hospital now with Tsunade as Hokage. Yukumo said she would take it into consideration as they went by every day. He had yet to realize of how distrusting she was of the Hokage and the village as a whole. Days turned to weeks and weeks turned to months, now Lee had a stable understanding of his new taijutsu style and had enough knowledge on medical jutsu but couldn't practice them. He still couldn't perform a jutsu by emitting chakra to the outside world beyond sticking to walls and walking on water. But he knew he was making progress. When Shizun entered the room of the classroom, she was reading the report given to her by one of the doctors concerning Lee's performance. Lee San, good job in impressing the doctors here in the hospital, they can be very passionate about their work and to see someone working so hard and doing well, showing interest to their line of work is making them impartial to you. Over the course of four and a half months, you have understood some of the most complex healing theories concerning chakra very well. Are you sure you don't want to be a medic nin? Lee gave a salute and replied, No, I do not, Shizun San. I am not fit for something so complicated and time-consuming. Let those with far greater talent in the art flourish like Sakura San. I am sure she is well on her way to become a true successor to Godime Sama. 
Indeed it had been four and a half months, and during those months, Lee maintained his routine. However, something stopped. Near the end of the third month, Yakumo stopped sneaking out of the compound. Lee had wondered why, though he couldn't just ask the hostile Kurama clan head for that question that was just asking for trouble. He could not see hide nor hair of her since then. But he would wait for her every day on that same spot for about an hour before he would go his way. Lee was saddened by this, why wasn't she seeing him now again? His thoughts were cut off when Shizun spoke. Shizun smiled, that she is. She improves by leaps and bounds and that is with her learning about combat as well. I heard your friend Neji is being considered for Junin again and this time, Hokage-sama is actually considering it. I'm not surprised if she considers your entire team now, as well. An image of Neji appeared on Lee's mind and his doubt of being a Junin just because he had yet to discover his true potential, I appreciate your praise, Shizun-san. Though I am still nowhere near to be considered a Junin, at least not until I have the chance to learn and master the Jutsu you are going to teach me. Shizun gave a thought at this and hummed to herself, I guess. We should head to the training room and have you hooked up with the equipment. We can begin teaching you about the jutsu today. You mean. Shizun gave a nod. You are now deemed able to learn this jutsu. We'll proceed further as we discuss this to you in the training room. Lee was ecstatic. He was utterly floored when his hard work was finally paying off. He was finally catching up. When they finally made it to the training room, Shizun had her associates prepare all the necessary equipment as Lee was asked to remove his black Changshan coat and Lee complied by slipping out his coat and letting it fall to his waist. Lee then removed his black sleeveless shirt and mesh armor as the medics began plugging him with multiple wires, two on the side of his head, several on his chest and abdomen as well as his arms and feet. One of the medics then prepared an intravenous infusion set. Lee could see it in the background and saw just below it was a small cooler. Lee guessed that it has a pack of whole blood in it. Lee San, for this jutsu to work, you will have to endure some pain as we inflict small injuries to you by a scalpel. Why we have the IV line prepared now is because we are afraid that you might bleed out. Anesthetics will not work, you won't respond well enough even with proper stimuli if we sedate you. I apologize but we need to see this jutsu perform in its intended environment. Shizun said this as she held up a clipboard while Lee gave a silent nod. I am prepared, Lee said as he closed his eyes and imagined his chakra flowing throughout his body. Subject's brain waves are normal, chakra levels are fluctuating based on his level. Shizun noted and said, let's begin the experiment. And then, the scalpel had cut flesh as it spilled blood. Lee winced. For three days, Lee endured the pain. He had forgotten how much pain was a great motivator to do well. Every time he was cut, he would let his chakra convert to healing chakra inside his body and then with the flow in his system, settled them to a specific site and let the healing chakra do its thing. For the first day or first trial, it failed, horribly. The first cut on his shoulder ended up being stitched back and healed by Shizun. Lee was still not used to convert chakra to healing chakra. It was why it backfired. Shizun anticipated this and was prepared to heal Lee. It was messy. Lee had asked for one more trial and Shizun relented. This time, the cut was on his arm, the chakra never even once converted to healing chakra. It was a setback and Lee had to be healed again. By the third week, Lee had scars on his body now courtesy of the training methods. But he would not be deterred. This time, he would succeed. We can't keep doing this, Lee San. Pretty soon we'll have to drop the intravenous set in favor of placing you in the hospital. Lee was adamant. No. Please. I need to keep going. My chakra is finally starting to adapt a bit. I wish to continue. Lee focused again and let his chakra fluctuate and turn into healing chakra. This time, Lee remained calm. He thought of many peaceful things. He thought of friends, his sensei, and his home. And they all felt calming to him. His thoughts were now interrupted by the sudden jolt of pain on his right shoulder. This time however, instead of bleeding out, the wound slowly closed on its own giving off a wafting steam as the wound closes. Lee looked at it peacefully. Shizun, who was looking at the clipboard and at the different machines, she smiled. Congratulations, you've made progress. Lee nodded with a dumbfound expression and then looked at Shizun. Not just that, Shizun-san. I think there's something else happening. Lee said this as soon as his right shoulder bulked up a little as veins gorged and formed from them. 
Whoa. A few minutes later, the hypertrophied muscle returned back to its former size and shape while smoke still wafted out from them. Shizun dropped her clipboard and pen after what she just saw and immediately picked it up to put it in her journal notes. Jutsu performed had an unknowing side effect of muscular hypertrophy at the site of injury after healing. Tests are a success. However, a new problem has emerged. Just as she was about to ask Lee, Shizun suddenly fell to the ground unconscious. Shizun San. Shizun Sama. Lee caught her just in time before she fell on her head and suddenly felt the world spinning around him with the image of a grotesque and demonic looking Yukumo encircling him and giving a dangerous giggle. Her hand reached out to his face but was suddenly stopped when he heard a voice. No. Don't touch Lee San. Fool. I am ridding you of your problem, Yukumo. He has been filling you with nothing but false hope in order for Konoha to get rid of you. He's not like that. Gah. Stubborn girl. Just then, Lee snapped out of the genjutsu and saw everyone evidently knocked out in the room. He frowned. That was genjutsu. Possibly Yukumo's, but what could have caused this? He went out after getting dressed and putting his changshin back on, seeing people on the floor of the village completely knocked out. He scowled and jumped towards the place where he knew Yukumo would be most likely at, the compound. When he arrived, he saw familiar faces knocked out as well. Sakura, Ino, Choji and even Shikamaru were down for the count. He tried to wake them, but they were under the genjutsu to no avail. With clenched fists, he barged inside the clan compound of the Yukumo clan and destroyed the door. Inside was the clan head and he was peculiarly fighting Kurinai. What on earth is going on? Lee asked out loud, Kurinai and the man turned to him. So you're the one responsible for my niece's insolence as of late. You were the one giving a dangerous person like her ideas. The man shouted as he turned his attention to Lee and was about to charge at him. I won't let you. Kurinai was about to perform a genjutsu when Lee stopped the man cold in his tracks by catching the man's fist. Yukumo-san has as much right to spread her wings as anybody. Caging her like some animal is a very cruel thing to do. She wants to be a strong shinobi yet you would deny her of that right. What makes you decide what is good for her? It was then that Lee felt pure anger for the first time. He reeled his fist back and smashed it on the man's face as he was sent flying to the opposite side. I am angry that someone would deny them of the youth that they should be living. No one should decide to imprison someone outside of the law. If it is your decree to cage her, then it is my responsibility to set her free. Free from your tyranny. Lee removed his chanchion and let it fall by waist showing off the black sleeveless undershirt with the mesh armor on and then proceeded to enter in his new stance. The man gave a hollow laugh, you. Set her free, you do not know what kind of monster she is. She will bring the village to ruin. She will destroy everything. Lee responded, I have met your niece and all I saw from her was her earnest wish to become a shinobi. You, who only saw her weakness, have no right to speak that against her. What does a fool who only knows one thing know? The old man spat at the boy. You only have one thing that you are good at and a complete zero on the rest. You do not know what kind of power she can bring. You're just a one-trick pony. Lee closed his eyes as he remained in his stance. He remembered the times when he struggled to become a shinobi, he remembered the days where he trained constantly only to be berated by then cruel Neji. He remembered losing again and again against him and being left in the dust by the new rookies like Naruto and Sasuke. All of them were memories he would rather forget. But now, now it was different. I used to believe that mastering Gokan alone would make me a stronger ninja. But I was a fool to think so. I would be so linear and predictably, my opponents will learn to adapt to my skills. Gai Sensei has taught me that and it took me a year to finally establish the basics right. This is my new taijutsu. Prepare yourself, for this name echoes through my soul, burning with fury and passion, for it is here I have finally gained my enlightenment and it is in this place that you will hear the cry of the savage green beast. For I will forever etch it into your mind as I drive my fists into your face. Lee opened his eyes, sharpened and steeled with full of resolve and anger. With a single step forward, Lee disappeared before anyone could blink. He improved his speed. Kurinai thought and then, she could swear she could hear a loud whistle dropping in tune when she suddenly heard a crash coming from Kurama Unkai's direction. Crash. Kurinai turned around and saw Unkai flying as Lee vanished once more and jabbed Unkai this time, coming from the other side. 
I have learned two taijutsu styles to make my movements become difficult to read and unpredictable. Whereas Gokan has allowed me to attack in linear formations at high speed, this new taijutsu emphasizes movement and mobility attacking with simple but effective ways in punching. Li then appeared just behind Unkai and appeared as if he had split in two before forming behind him. Genjutsu. No. I did not sense his chakras fluctuate. Then it's pure speed. Unkai noted as he was slammed down with an axle kick hitting the ground. Unkai had no time to recover as Li kicked him forward and vanished once more. From my enlightenment, I dubbed this taijutsu style, Rakankan, Achiever of Nirvana Fist. Now you are witnessing one of its newest moves. Bakuryukan, Burst Dragon Fist. Unkai wanted to clasp his hands together to perform a jutsu but every time he would do so, Li would intercept him and deliver blow after blow like a streaking meteor. He struck his opponent just as he would bypass their guard and vanish only to punish his opponent again completely dismantling whatever form of physical defense he had against the taijutsu user. Li then became like a streak of green and black all over the place as he hit Unkai multiple times to sides where he was vulnerable. Unkai had no time to perform any genjutsu due to Li's devastating blows. Li appeared at his front, teeth clenched in constrained anger as he walloped Unkai square in the face and sending him flying once more and Li reappeared once more this time, performing a spinning kick directly to his back. Unkai skidded on the wooden floor as it gave way and was entrenched by several meters away from Li. When the dust, debris and splinters settled, they saw Unkai down for the count, unconscious and unresponsive but still alive. Kurinai nodded at this, good job Li, now we need to go after Ito and stop her from getting out of control. Out of control? Li asked as Kurinai nodded. Yes, Yakumo has a fearsome talent in Genjutsu. Her alignment for it is so strong that her talent destabilizes her mind and creates a monstrous personality within her. This personality is sadistic and brutal and presents Yakumo's resentful attitude towards Konoha and her clan. It was the reason why we had to seal her powers. She cannot control that personality. If anything, Ito controls her. Lee then asked, Ito is the personality's name. Kurinai nodded. Now things made more sense. But still, for him, it was far too cruel to have clipped the wings of one person out of fear. He had heard enough of such a treatment being given to Naruto. He didn't want others to feel the same. So with that, when they finally arrived inside the mansion, Lee stopped for a moment as Yakumo's form turned to him. The form was repulsive and frightening in a way. Her skin were not as soft as he had seen before, now they were wrinkled, almost scale-like. Two long horns protruded beside her temples giving her that intimidating look that would scare anyone away. So you've come, a Kurinai. Lee looked at Kurinai who looked in trepidation as the girl seemed to float sideways and tilting her head to the side in a disturbing manner as she giggled. Always the obedient Kunoichi. Have you come to finish the job that the Sandame Hokage had set out to do? Yakumo, whatever it is you're thinking, the Sandame only wanted what was best for you. You couldn't possibly control your power at that age. Silence. After all this time, I trusted you yet you betrayed me by sealing my powers away. Why? So you could torment me before finally killing me. I would never kill you, Yakumo. The Sandame would never give out such an order. Don't give me that, Kurinai Sensei. You grew scared of my abilities. It was why you stopped training me. You didn't think I could use this power very well. Ito rambled, with a hint of venom when she said the word, Sensei, to Kurinai. Li looked at Kurinai who was silent and then turned to Yakumo with a thought, Ah, now I see. Kurinai Sensei didn't have enough faith in Yakumo-san to keep trying. If she did, then things wouldn't have gotten up to this point. Yakumo-san, I understand your situation. However, Kurinai Sensei has shown her sincerity earlier by fending off your uncle who was planning to kill you. I do not know the circumstances of the bond between you and Kurinai Sensei but what I do know is that I have to put my faith in you as a friend. I must believe that you can control your power. For a moment, the apparition known as Ito paused and then they heard a shout coming from her as Ito shouted, stubborn girl. What does it matter that some fool would believe in you? You are nothing without me. It was then that Kurinai finally spoke. The night I talked to Sandane, we discussed your situation and he thought it best to seal away your memories of that night along with your power. We couldn't predict what would happen if you remembered that you were the one who killed your parents with your power unchecked. No, Yakumo muttered, 
Ido seemed to gain control from Yukumo's despair and she grinned as a figurative hand slowly inched their way on Yukumo's neck. No, the seal was now broken, and memories of a time gone by entered her mind, she could remember the day her father and mother died in an illusion of flames. She clutched her head as her sanity began to slip. No, Yukumo shouted as she escaped from the clutches of Ido who writhed in pain as Yukumo separated from her. Lee and Kuranai went beside her checking to see if she was fine. I killed them, Yukumo mumbled. Tears were threatening to fall down from her face as she did so, her right hand in a tight closed fist as it was shaking in anger, mortification and sadness. Yukumo then surprised Kuranai by grabbing one of her kanai and then proceeded to jam her throat with the blade. Blood was spilled, but it was not her blood. She looked down, not expecting there to have any pain until she saw Lee holding the blade with his bandaged left hand as blood dripped from it. In order for sin to be considered as sin, then you must have full intent in doing so. Accidents happen, Yukumo-san. What happened to your parents was not your entire fault. He then turned around to the monstrous-looking form of Ido. So live, Yukumo-san. Be enthralled with youth. Appreciate your life and live it to the fullest. And if you cannot move on, I will be there with you to pick you up. If you make mistakes, I will be there through your failures and I will share your joy and your successes. For that is youth. He gave Yukumo a thumbs up with his bloodied arm for his nice guy pose. Kuranai smiled, envious of the way guy teaches his students. Perhaps she should do the same for her own students from now on, to have faith in them. Yukumo watched in awe as she stared at the back of Lee, reassuring her that for all of her faults, he would be there for her as a true friend. To have a loyal friend to the end, now you don't have to watch your back. Kuranai mentioned with a smile as she helped Yukumo up. In turn, Lee went to another stance of his new taijutsu, the Rakenkan, achiever of Nirvana Fist. Pitiful monster from the depths of darkness, you have plagued Yukumo-san enough of your delusions. Now I will send you back to those depths and forever shall you be sealed there. Yukumo-san is strong. She doesn't need your help. Shut up. I am a part of Yukumo and Yukumo is a part of me. We are two sides of the same coin. To kill me means to kill Yukumo herself. Ido cackled as flames suddenly sprouted from all around the compound with Lee being flash burned as well. Lee screamed at the top of his lungs as he was sent on the ground, rolling and writhing in agony. He was trying to put out the flames as best as he can but Ido did not let up. Lee, this is a genjutsu. This entire compound is under the jutsu of Yukumo's power. Calm yourself and you can dispel this genjutsu without much problem. It's useless. Without Yukumo to control me as she did earlier. I can do whatever I wish now and none of you can ever hope stop me. Welcome to my world, Kuranai, and burn in hell for all I care. It was then that Unkai had appeared from the entrance of the room staggering and battered beyond all recognition. He had a hand up into a seal and shouted to Ido. I knew that a demon like you would be too much to control one day. I will rid this world of you and maybe then we can all live in peace. The Kurama clan will be great again. Focusing all chakra outwards, Unkai dispelled most of the miasmic chakra around him. Kai. Just then, the sound of shattering glass was heard from above and an Anbu member with a hawk mask had a sword drawn and it headed towards Ido just as Unkai collapsed on the floor from exhaustion. Ido managed to evade in time but the three Tomode Sharingan spun madly, dispelling the genjutsu around them. Lee stopped rolling on the ground, groaning as he did so. His skin looked untouched. Smoke wafted off from him still. Lee, get up. We know you're not injured. The masked Anbu member said this as he pointed the sword towards Ido. It's time we put an end to this nonsense. Kuranai frowned. You were watching us this whole time, weren't you? Why didn't you intervene? The Anbu member replied, I'm not a genjutsu expert and whatever I could decipher, it took me considerable time to do especially a genjutsu of this complexity. Lee was lucky enough that Yukumo's mind wanted to protect him and that Ido can't do anything against him until this very moment. It was thanks to Unkai's dispelling technique that I could finally destroy this genjutsu in the compound. The hawk-masked Anbu then turned to Ido as he slid his sword down on the floor catching fire on the blade as he performed a half-moon stance. No, Sasuke-kun. Ido is mine. Lee finally stood up and smoke wafted from him. His muscles had become more defined and bulky but not overly so. The scar tissue he had all over his body were now disappearing as he finally said. For I must thank her in finally giving me the chance to use this jutsu, properly. 
Sasuke looked at Lee and noticed the chakra was not leaving his body but instead, it was circulating within him. Due to the small pathways that Lee presented, it was almost invisible but Sasuke could tell that there was a thin veil of chakra surrounding Lee but never actually expelling from him. An interesting healing technique, what is its name? Lee shook his head, there is still no name for this technique. But if it did, I would name this Kongo Show, Diamond Way, Sasuke Kun. He noted as he gave a nod. Very well. But you will refer to me by my codename of, Taka. Whenever I am wearing this mask, I am an operative of Anbu. With that, Lee charged like a rampaging bull. He smashed through Ido with his fist on her stomach and drove her to the wall making a hole behind her as Lee then dragged the monster by the collar and dragged her body on the wall like a ragdoll before he kicked her in the face sending her flying upwards. Lee didn't stop as he switched his combat style this time and used his reliable taijutsu style, the Goken as he unfurled all the bandages in his arms wrapped them around Ido. Hachiman Tonko. Daichiman Kaiman Kai. Eight gates opening. The first gate, the limit gate, open. Lee then began spinning like a drop as they descended to the ground as air began to pick up with Lee creating a vacuum force, increasing the speed of their drop. Omit Renge, initial lotus. Crash. And then, a shockwave soon followed. Lee stood up as he recovered. He saw as his bandages unwrapped themselves with Ito falling on the ground back first. Yukumo now stood before her. Ito, throughout most of my life, I thought that you were the only one I could completely trust. You made it clear that everyone around me was an enemy and even those that I idolized were not prone to betraying my trust. Ido was unresponsive as she looked at Yukumo who was looking pitiful at him. Yet you were the one I shouldn't have trusted. I let you feed me with your paranoia and your fear. You made me afraid of what you were afraid. And even then, you made use of my powers against people that I care about down to the point that you would use it on Lee San someone who has been honest ever since we met him. Ido clicked her tongue and soon noticed that she was vanishing. No more. I have had enough of this. Enough of the fear from you, I wish to be who I am. I wish to follow my dreams to become a ninja and like Lee San, I will overcome all the hurdles presented to me. That is because I have seen what his hard work had accomplished and now I want to see just how far I can go. You will never get rid of me. I am you. I am your instinct, the one who will stop at nothing for self-preservation. I know. But I will continue to move forward. One day, I will learn to control you and you will see. With that, Ido disappeared from the physical world. And all over Konoha, the rest of the villagers and ninja soon awoke from the temporary nightmare that was Ido. Three months later. One. Two. One. Two. One. Two. It was four in the morning again in Konoha and a pair of joggers was running by the village and got out by the village gate, though if anyone were to look closer, the other half of the runners wasn't the usual Meta guy that was running with Lee today in the morning at this ungodly hour. Guy had been assigned on a mission and wouldn't be back for another three days. This time, Lee is accompanied by Yakumo, who was now wearing a track suit as she and Lee gave a light run around the village. This would be Yakumo's second long distance run after being given with a clean bill of health. After the whole fiasco considering the Kurama clan a few months back, Yukumo had complied to Lee's recommendation and had to undergo a checkup at the hospital. It was perfect timing too, because the one who was reading the discharge notes for Shinobi to be released for active duty was Tsunade herself. She had a look at Yukumo within a mere few minutes and soon ordered Sakura to grab the necessary herbal plants for her to create some medicine for her condition. Needless to say, after about a week of medication and checkups from Tsunade or Shizun, Yukumo never felt better that day onward. Tsunade even remarked that the small exercises to improve her stamina certainly helped. Causing the busty Hokage to nod at Lee and gave him some praise as well as some money for his hard work. Granted, her physique would take a while to match a chunin or even a junin for that matter, but Yukumo was making great progress. As for Lee though, he had returned to routine as soon as he was out of the medical research lab. Guy had given him enough pointers to learn for about more than a week's time if ever he would be missing. But Lee now would practice with Yukumo instead of Guy. Only instead of learning, Lee would teach Yukumo tips on exercising and some basic taijutsu moves to help her in the academy. Of course, but when it came to downtime, Lee would drag Yukumo along to introduce to his friends and teammates. Lee introduced Yukumo to Neji while Tenten looked amused by the two. Though, a peculiar thing remained, 
Li never went back to his jumpsuit and kept the Changshan style shirt out of the fact that it was the symbol of his progress. Li had become much more proficient in his newly dubbed technique, Kongo Show. And like the name suggested, Li was near impervious to damage. Not only that, it amplified his muscle strength by several fold it was why they enlarge like that. When Guy had found out, he was ecstatic to see it firsthand. When Li showed it to him, Guy was crying manly tears of joy and his fists shook passionately as he did so. Ha! Li, all your hard work has finally paid off. I can see your ability rising to greater heights. I am so proud of you. Li. Now it was Li's turn to burst into tears, Guy Sensei. Thank you for always putting your faith in me. I swear to you that I will continue to move forward with the path I have chosen and I will continue to do you proud, Guy Sensei. Ooh oh. Li. Guy Sensei. Li. Guy Sensei. Li. Guy Sensei. Li. Guy Sensei. Then, the manly hug came as did the sunset on an open shore with the loud waves of the sea crashing on them. Does this often happen with them? Yakumo asked. Neji and Tenten stared at each other and then gave a sigh of exasperation. You'll get used to it. Tenten replied. Eventually. Neji continued. In these months, several things happened. Neji had finally been promoted to Junin. His performance during missions had exponentially risen after his mastery of his newest jutsu. Team Guy went out to celebrate that day and Lee, having found confidence and trust within himself, never grew bitter about it. The two grew as better friends and rivals about it. To which Yakumo found amusing much to Tenten and Neji's own embarrassment. Tenten had just finished her arsenal and had changed her wardrobe entirely. Whereas she always wore a chongsam as her upper attire, she had changed it for a black long sleeve shirt with her flak vest on top. She also wore a pair of white gloves on her hands with multiple seals written on them complemented with her long black pants with two holster belts that had scrolls on them. Her outfit was then complemented by a short pink cape that reached to her back lapeled around her shoulders hiding her arms and connected in place by a single rope along with a pair of sandals that reached up to her thigh. Kiba had finally arrived home looking shaggy and hairy like he was a vagabond with tattered clothes but with a pelt on his shoulders while Akamaru was wearing some light armor. Hanada and Hanabi followed suit, now with Hanada holding a scroll in her hands and wearing robes meant for nobles on a delegation trip. If anyone were to notice, her hands were wrapped in numerous amounts of band-aid. Sakura had just finished her course with Tsunade, she had been asked to help Shizune in the hospital, and she had also been training with elemental manipulation under Kakashi's tutelage. So far, she had been learning well with her earth chakra and had also been helping out in the research and development department. Sasuke had been out on Anbu missions now. His training with the Anbu had been officially complete when he filed his papers. He had also discovered that he had the Mangekio Sharingan along with Kakashi. But less out of that, Uchiha Sasuke also learned about combining his fire and lightning elements. Something also woke up within Sasuke one day on a specific mission and it was the day that would forever change his life. Choji had finally come home after several months of disappearances as well on his own from the fire temple, with nothing but a monk's robe donning him as well as a single wooden staff and wearing a pair of geta sandals. In his staffless hand was a small scroll. Shikamaru had been working in the strategic center and logistics division for some time now and had been looking through his family log journals for appraisal. Due to the nature of his work, he had been very busy had not much time to spend around with his teammates. Ino had finally gotten been inducted to the intelligence department. She was assigned with Ibiki in the interrogations unit along with Anko. It took her a while as she had a lot of preparations to do before entering the department as Kurinai can attest, but it was a long time coming. Shino had come home from a mission and did so by coming to the village on board his new summon, a giant horned beetle. He had jumped down from his summon as it dispelled and landed on top of the Hokage's office with an unconscious girl in his arms. Shino stormed through the office front, barging in through the Hokage's door with a chilling message as to what had just happened. Taki has been destroyed. Akatsuki has struck the small country and the only survivor left is this girl. Tsunade stood up, alarmed of this message. Had Jiraiya's informants been wrong? What on earth happened? Call for an emergency meeting. I want to get the best messenger hawk that could get to Jiraiya as soon as possible as well as one for Suna, we're going to need to have a discussion on our hands right away. That's it for this part if you enjoyed it then like, 
share and subscribe for the next video as it's going to be more interesting and also check out my other playlists hope you would like them too.